Welcome everybody back into Nerd Sesh. As always, I'm Carson Brabber and alongside me is Logan Camden. And today we are joined by none other than the Matthew Spawn Hour of the Stay Hot Podcast friend, but also nemesis of the show. And you guys will see why later. We're going to do a little bit of J. Cole, Kendrick talk. This guy has got blackness in his heart and hatred and it shows. But anyways, good to have you here, I suppose. How are you today, man? I'm doing good. Um, you mm-hmm. know, I woke up this morning and J. Cole had saved us from from mumble rap, and he had he had r- brought real rap back. And yeah, well, you're a Kendrick fan, so how is he not guilty of all the same things? It's different, man. Kendrick's nice, no, and not. J. Cole is. I don't know what to tell you. Oh, it's different. No, it is. All right. Well, we'll get there. We'll get there. Anyways, <laughs> we're gonna start with some basketball and we're going to start by talking about a couple teams who have been billed as top contenders throughout the year but recently have been having issues of different natures but just the vibes and the results aren't necessarily the best so matt we'll start with you who are you more concerned about heading into the playoffs the bucks or the clippers dude it's pretty close Mm -hmm. it was a good question uh when i when i saw it at first Thank you. Both are, I feel like, a little bit older, and both have been not closing out the season well. Uh, Both, I think, are going to head towards pretty brutal round one matchups. The Clippers have a red-hot Mavs team. It looks like, it could change, but looks like they're going to match up with the Mavs now. And there's some real risk that the Bucks, even though they're a two-seed, get the 76ers as their first-round matchup Mm -hmm. with Embiid, which would be... A totally unfair break. Um, I don't think the Bucks perimeter defense is going to get better. I think their problems are super real. And I think the the whole Doc Rivers, his record since he's gotten there and him losing in the second round and all that, like, I don't feel like that's going to change this season. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I look over at the Clippers, and they haven't been playing good ball. And the Harden stuff is not very good right now. And... I think expecting that to turn around in the playoffs just feels like really, really unlikely, you know? Yeah. And it sucks because that Harden speech that was made at the start of the year by that Mavs announcer, <laughs> people are going to victory lap about that. It's like, and maybe there's some truth to it, and maybe Harden is wrong in some situations, but I just hate how it summed up his whole career. It's like everywhere he went, it was all his fault. 100% of the time, it's like, dude, it's not that simple. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think when I look at it, I think the Bucks have a better chance of avoiding the 76ers. And who knows exactly like what, how healthy and 100% and bead will be. Uh, whereas I think the Clippers, almost no matter what, are going to have a pretty difficult matchup. There's not much they can avoid. And then I think Giannis is, is the best player between those two teams. So mm-hmm. you get an easier matchup. You get the better of, of, of you know Kawhi and Giannis is who I'm comparing. And I, I think it's more likely the Bucks make it out of the first round, I would say. So I would say I'm, I'm more worried about the Clippers and the narratives there. But it's pretty close. And I don't think Milwaukee is going to like win the title or, or maybe even necessarily right. be a real threat to the Celtics, it feels like, with how they're playing. I agree with that, too. I mean, I'm going to regurgitate some of the things about Doc Rivers. I mean, it starts with Doc. Uh, I also think, shout out Kendrick Lamar, I think it's a little bit of poetic justice that uh, – we could get Sixers round one, man. I think. Oh, yeah. Well, shout awesome. out J. Cole, who dropped a song called Hunting Wabbits. Ah, what's up, Doc? <laughs> Am I right? Uh, shout out Kendrick. I will not be shouting out J. Cole on this podcast. Um, no. Your loss. <laughs> her loss. Shout out Drake. Um, anyway, <laughs> so I, I just think it's funny, man, that uh, we could get Philly, Milwaukee in the first round. I think that's a tough beat for Milwaukee, but they got Doc, so they were going to be chopped from the jump anyways. I want to expand on what Matt was talking about with this Harden stuff, dude. The Clippers are done for, in my opinion, and I think it starts with uh, James Harden's performance. Uh, these are his last 15 games. I don't have his numbers from uh, last night's game, uh, so these are the last 15, excluding the last game that uh, the Clippers played. He didn't have a great game anyway, so they're similar. 13, 5, and 10 on 52% true shooting. Get this, guys. In this 15-game stretch, he's shooting 37% from the field, 29% from behind the arc, 19% at the top of the key, 30% at the right wing, 23% from the corners, and 9% below league average at the rim. 
31% on by far his favorite shot, step back threes, 28% on jumpers, and 25% on pull-up jumpers. Like, he's been abysmal, dude. And it, I, I'm not saying that James Harden isn't going to impact the game. I've been very critical of James Harden in the past. I think he provides a very valuable role on this team as a table setter as and as an orchestrator. But at some point in the playoffs, the Los Angeles Clippers are going to need James Harden to step up and actually serve buckets at some point. They're going to need him to step up in big moments. And he's cost them multiple games in this stretch with bad shooting performances. And the Clippers have survived multiple bad shooting performances from Harden because of guys like Kawhi Leonard and Paul George stepping up. I'm talking about eking out games, man. One point two-point uh, wins. He's a one-trick pony at this point, in my opinion. Uh, he's yeah. so predictable, can't explode off the dribble, can't get downhill, and consistently settles for uh, contested, out-of-rhythm, you know, step-back jumpers early in the shot clock. And, you know, Harden has an inherently hard shot diet. I think that's something that is just tough. You know, th those are the shots he takes, mid-range, step-backs, tough looks. But he's not just missing the hard stuff, guys. He's missing wide open stuff. Again, these numbers over the last 15. 22% on open threes. 33% on wide open threes. And he's shooting a whopping 25% off the catch. So, you know, I just don't even trust Harden to pull his weight as the third guy. You said it, Matt. He's a consistent playoff underperformer. And I still think Harden is the biggest reason that you can't trust the Clippers in the playoffs. If we get... Mavs clips, man, that's not even a thought. Go to work, Luca. Put these boys to bed and let's move on with it. Yeah, I mean, it sucks, dude. I, I've been fighting the the Harden battle for a long time. I've always been upset about twenty eighteen. Why? And why? Why have you been fighting the Harden battle, Matt? Because I, I always <laughs> think Harden has gotten a little disrespected, and I think he got a really tough break in 2018 when like that was a year to win the title. And even though it was a super team warriors, like they figured it out and people were wrong about Chris Paul and Harden that year. They were super good. I remember the whole thing was like, there's no way there's only one ball. They made it work mm -hmm. and they blew it in game seven with Chris Paul out. They were that close. And even as a Bron guy, like they would have beaten that Cavs team. They were yeah. that close to pulling it off. So I've always thought that he's got a little disrespected, but I, I can't disagree with anything you said. I mean, He's he's never been the guy with like the most counters ever, and post hamstring injury, really the the burst not being there has limited him even more. Uh, the the hard shots are you know some games gonna fall I guess you remember he back when he was with the 76ers like they get in a series and he could put up 41 night and then nine the other it's like okay yeah it's impressive you can do that on those difficult shots but that's sort of mm -hmm. the reality of it and when you're a third option here and with the Clippers it's just not not gonna work and it, it's it's brutal because without the ball in his hands he's not particularly effective so the only thing to do is is to keep giving him the ball if you want to put him in uh, and, and considering how bad that's been I just don't know if you can the Mavs again red hot Luca you know he's gonna go for like 35 a game or oh, whatever yeah. it's the so Clippers it's, bro he'll give him 40 it just, God, it just feels so so over that's such a bad matchup with with getting that that Mavs team at this time so I agree yeah I'm really disappointed with the Clippers because this has basically been the version of the Clippers that I expected we would see when they made the Harden trade I was like yeah this makes them slightly better but it doesn't really move the needle in the west I was still like all right are they going to be able to defend at a high enough level I uh, had some concerns just about what sort of off-ball value is Harden going to bring. I did like the idea of adding a third star creator, a little bit of insurance there, but I was also like PG and Kawhi need to have the ball in their hands a lot. And so I had these concerns and uh, then it just didn't matter for a while. I mean, they were world beaters. They were whooping everybody. And now obviously things have been pretty ugly as of late. And I am not totally out on the Clippers. I still think this is a really good basketball team. The biggest problem is just that they haven't really given a shit about defense for two months. Like, they're 28th in defensive rating since February 1st. That's awful. I still think that they are capable of being a solid defensive team. They don't have a really high ceiling there, but when Kawhi and PG are engaged, that's still a quality wing duo defensively. Terrence Mann can take some of those smaller guard point of attack matchups. Zubots will protect the rim and rebound. Like, there's no reason for them to be this bad. That, to me, is just an effort in disengagement thing. And that's not good, but it shouldn't matter as much in those playoff settings. 
But I am concerned about the path. Like, that's a big difference maker here. And you mentioned it, Matt. It's not looking great for the Bucks either. Like, there's kind of three outcomes. You could get the Pacers, which, my God, you're hoping for. Or you're going to get the Sixers, who are just way more talented than a 7 or 8 seed wherever they end up. Or you're going to get the Heat, who are just a tough matchup and obviously beat them last year. But specifically, what concerns me there is how well Bam guards Giannis and just having a guy who physically can hold up in those settings in single coverage who Giannis isn't able to bully like we saw some ugly moments in crunch time last year in that series and a mm -hmm. lot of that just was because Bam was so damn good so I would definitely like Milwaukee in that matchup against the Heat I just think they're more talented and I do think that their problem was lacking an identity in crunch time last year and although it doesn't always feel like they have a great sense of the hierarchy at least they have Damian Lillard now and they have an elite half court shot creator and shot maker they can lean on so I like them I would pick them in all those matchups but it's not necessarily going to be a walk in the park at the same time the Clips are probably going to have to face Dallas round one and with how much better that team has been defending, with how much they've improved their size and athleticism in the front court, and with what the Luka and Kyrie duo, and especially Luka, can do, I would lean Dallas in that matchup. And then even if they survive that, you have to go on the road again. And there are certain matchups where I wouldn't hate them, but if Cat is back, I don't love them against Minnesota. I don't love them against OKC. And if it ends up being Denver that snags the one seed, then they're cooked. I mean, they just really have no chance in that series. Whereas Milwaukee, it's like, okay, you survived the first round. Then you're going to host Cleveland, a Cleveland team that unfortunately hasn't had all their pieces healthy like all year. And now it's Mitchell right. who's banged up. And just because of that, I commend them for how well they've played given those circumstances. But, uh, I don't love that going into the playoffs. So I still have issues with the Bucs, like a lot of issues. Over their last 15, they're 7-8. and eight. They're 17th in offensive rating, 23rd in defensive rating. They have not solved any of their fundamental issues. All their red flags still remain. Coaching, Adrian Griffin wasn't good. Doc Rivers isn't good. Didn't fix that. Point of attack defense, bringing in Pat Bev, shocker, wasn't a cure-all. The Dame Giannis fit they still have not maximized. But at the same time, I believe in the formula of just the overwhelming duo of Damon Giannis more than I believe in what the Clippers are doing right now. Like you mentioned, the best player on the floor factor, Matthew, that really matters. And even though it's been up and down for Dame this year and he's banged up right now, I believe in him in those playoff settings as that half court shot creator and shot maker. And when those two play, the Bucks are 43 and 20. They have a plus 10 net rating with them on the floor. Like they have been a great team with those two out there in spite of the fact that they have all of these issues alongside them. And then when I look at LA, it is the path. It is the defense. It is absolutely Harden who has just been awful, awful. Logan, you mentioned some of his numbers over his last 13 games under 49% true shooting. Like the guy cannot make a shot. And there are certain instances in which he is completely passive as well. You barely feel his impact on the game. And then you have a game like last night where he has this hot second quarter. But overall, it's just another brutal shooting night. He can't create those looks around the rim. And that's what we saw in last year's postseason as well. Like, he just was not capable of getting a step consistently enough. And then against these bigger athletes around the rim, his finishing was awful. So... He ends up going 6 of 23 last night, and Denver was, like, blitzing him down the stretch, and I was kind of like, why? I mean, let him try to do something with you in single coverage because he's just missing shots over and over again. So, with him at this level, Kawhi has been healthy this year, but for this to be the stretch where he's banged up and he's missing a couple games with a knee thing, like, I'm not freaking out. It's probably just being better safe than sorry, but I don't love it at this time of year, and that's always a concern with the Clippers. So, both these teams have big issues. But I definitely like Milwaukee more. I still think Milwaukee probably gets to the Eastern Conference Finals. And right now, yeah. it's like, if these matchups stay, I'm not picking LA to get out of the first round. I mean, I, I'm trying to think of, okay, what's a scenario where Milwaukee gets to the Conference Finals? Very easy to imagine. Right. They just don't get a bad matchup round one and they play the Cavs, who are banged up around two. Imagining the Clippers getting to the Conference Finals would be legitimately insane. It would be the biggest shock of the postseason in a long time, honestly, with how they're going into the playoffs. So, I, yeah, I think your answer's got to be L.A. Yeah, I could see it happening for the Clippers. 
you would have right. to survive the match. I still think like their combination of I guess I guess you would think Kawhi would just go nuts. I I, right. I, I, I guess, but Kawhi then, goes berserk. Kawhi reaches they, that top five level that we know he's capable of. PG, I mean, if he is the level of jump shooter that he's capable of, like he is a devastating second option. You see it last night, just like the smoothness of that shot creation. Harden doesn't have an aneurysm every game. They engage defensively. It's like we saw this team go, what were they, 26 and 6 over a stretch? So I wouldn't pick it, but they're so talented that I can't say it's impossible. But I do still agree that, like, it's clearly less likely. I don't know, man. I, I think, especially with how the seeding is now, it would be like Mavs and then maybe Nuggets or Mavs and then Healthy, uh, healthy Timberwolves. Dude, I, I think it could get rough. Um, I, I guess I shouldn't count out Kawhi going, you know, 35 a night or whatever, and that's mm -hmm. possible. But I also think that, you know, Luca is going to do that. And as far as second options sure. go, you know, I think Kyrie is going to be on that level, but maybe it's not as hard as I'm, I'm saying. I, don't know. I mean, they, they, they shoot the lights out too. I mean, I think shooting variance always plays a really big yeah. role in these things too, but it's like, I mean, the nail in the coffin for me really is Harden. Like, again, at some point they're going to need him to step up. Like, I just, I don't anticipate it at all, bro. I think the guy's. I think he's completely, like, washed as a scorer, man. I, I don't know if he's got it in the tank anymore. If his shot is hitting, like, he's valuable, but, I mean, I don't know, dude. He just, he can't do anything else. He's had his good stretches this year, though, and it's like, if you mm -hmm. are fully healthy, and so now he's getting opposing teams' third best perimeter defenders, like, in single coverage, he doesn't always have to get a step. Like, sometimes he just does rain step back threes over those guys, and he's not getting the same whistle. He's not uh, obviously pressuring the rim at nearly the same level, so he's not getting the sort of free throw numbers he used to, but he's still a very crafty foul drawer. It's just inconsistent. It's very inconsistent at this stage in his career, and we saw that in the postseason last year, as you mentioned, Matthew, and that's the reality. That's why he had to be a third option, because you can't ask him to carry the load of just having to produce at that level also of having to draw like the opposing team's best perimeter defender you're not getting that james harden could you get a good third option james harden yes but i don't like what i'm seeing right now so i'm not optimistic about that and just to the broader point about harden's legacy because i'm the nba history guy you guys know me i think about all this stuff i do think some people take it too far in the anti-harden direction but I definitely am firmly on the side of he mostly bears responsibility for his team's playoff issues because we've seen individual regression there. And it does come down to play style. It comes down to, to some extent, the foul baiting in his reliance on getting to the line at a rate that is not going to be sustained in the playoffs when you don't get those same calls. It also comes down to the lack of versatility as a shot creator and overall offensive player. And if you are consistently going to the same couple of things over and over again, a, defenses can adapt to your tendencies over a seven-game series. B, you're just not maximizing your value as a great offensive player when you're not engaged away from the ball. And C, if those bread and butter things aren't working for you, then you just don't have the requisite number of counters, right? If you're not going to be a consistent high-level mid-range shot maker and you're saying, all right, I'm going to take 10 step-back threes this game, what happens when those step-back threes aren't falling and you go two of 10? And consistently, hard and shot, significantly worse from deep in those playoff environments and i think a large part of that is due to the predictability to some extent but also just like the wear and tear of i am going to carry this absurd offensive load on ball every single possession and uh, his legs just i think left him in a lot of those playoff runs so he just regressed year after year after year which is why like the people who say daryl morey this guy's the best offensive player it's like shut the fuck up no not even close but at the same time you're right like they probably would have won the 2018 title if Chris Paul stays healthy. And we can't pretend that James Harden isn't a great offensive engine, but he's not what he was in the regular season is my take on it. Yeah, I mean, I guess my point is he carried a big offensive load because he had to. The Houston teams were built for him to do that. And if he hadn't, the team wouldn't have been in a better spot. And I think a lot of people use Harden's shortcomings in the playoffs to make like a point about heliocentrism and how you know that'll never work and whatever and there's parts of it that won't and there's definitely downsides to it uh, mm -hmm. but I, I really disagree with that stuff well I think you can acknowledge that yes these teams were constructed 
where Harden bore an incredible responsibility as an on-ball creator. At the same time, he did play with Chris Paul. And when he had this second great on-ball shot creator alongside him, it's not like he started cutting. It's not like he started curling around screens. It's not like he started stressing defenses away from the ball. And I just don't want to excuse these great players for playing a style in which they are not particularly effective away from the ball because it's like you can be a great on-ball creator and then also stress defenses away from the ball and that's going to make everybody around you better and like that's the expectation that's where I have a problem with Harden's play style it's like all right if I'm going to lead to this stagnant offense where I have to have the ball every possession and then when I go away from the ball I'm not going to do anything it's just hard for great players to get the most out of their value playing alongside you in those situations and you add in the fact that he's a defensive liability, too. I think I will always hold that against Harden. Yeah, fair. Anyways, enough about James Harden's legacy. Let's move on to something else. A little bit of unfortunate news out of New York. And I'm not talking about the earthquake. Do you guys see that 4.7 earthquake? Everybody's freaking out. Settle down. That's nothing. I'm from California, all right? We get like 8.0s every day. I've never felt an earthquake. I'd like to feel one. You know the truth? I've never really felt a big one. I've only felt like a couple of like, ooh, the ground shook a little bit. I, I don't even think I've ever felt a 4.7, so I'm really not one to speak on this. But anyways, the news is Julius Randle is done for the year. He's been out for a while with that dislocated shoulder. Now mm -hmm. he's getting season-ending surgery. Logan, I know that you have been high on the healthy Knicks. Can they still make any noise without him in the playoffs? I'm so devastated, man. I am so sad right now, dude. I love the Knicks. I love what they've been building over the past couple years. I love the players that they've brought in. I'm honestly, dude, I'm I'm more bummed out about Julius Randle getting hurt than probably like even maybe even more than Malik Monk getting hurt, man. I'm I'm pretty shook up about all this, dude. Uh I I think it caps them from having a real finals run, uh Eastern Conference or NBA. I I had a really spicy take. We're going to do our top 10 contenders show soon, Carson. I had the Knicks as my number four contender in the entire playoff field uh, with a healthy like roster. Uh, number two out east behind Denver, Boston, and Dallas. Uh, mm -hmm. And I want to be clear about something. The, the Knicks are objectively better with Julius Randle, point blank period. They're 29-17 and 17 with Randle this season, a winning percentage of 63. They're 15-14 and 14 without Randle, 52% winning percentage. And... Uh, specifically, they were seven points per 100 possessions better with Randall on the floor, right? Jalen Brunson bears a massive responsibility for this offense, and Julius Randall just alleviates so much pressure on him. If that's taking post-up attempts, if that's, you know, getting downhill and weaponizing his body, um, and then adding in what he does defensively, like he's really strong and stout and can take on these physical wing matchups. I do think they are a little bit more well-equipped to, to deal with a Randall absence, though, uh, you know, I know that Randall's disappointed in the playoffs before. We've, te we've seen him turn into a black hole, taking pull-up jump shots, missing all kinds of shots. I mean, he really disappeared last year. Uh, he disappeared as the number one against Atlanta in their first round series, and he just didn't pull his weight as the number two guy last season in two playoff series. But the Knicks get OG Ananobi and Boyan Bogdanovich. I think Boyan Bogdanovich is the X factor to the Knicks making noise in the playoffs. Like, he's got to step up and... Uh, you know, pull a lot of weight offensively. But, look, the Knicks are still a very big physical and athletic team. They're obviously less without Randall, but uh, they're number eight overall in defensive rating. Uh, they've been top five defensive rating over the last 15, and they're number one in rebound rate this season. Specifically, though, I think it's because you can trust Jalen Brunson. Like, uh, Brunson is one of eight players, guys, in NBA history to average 27 points per game on 47-40 uh, splits. Larry Bird, Steph Curry, KD, Michael Jordan, Hakeem Olajuwon, and then Zach Levine and I'm Dale. I'm sorry. What was Hakeem? Dale Ellis. Two of five? Yeah, probably. Yeah, you didn't set a minimum for that one. He had that heater on him, though, man. He shot 40% from <laughs> behind the arc. Hakeem Olajuwon, one of the greatest three-point shooters ever? Let's Question see. mark? Um, the Knicks are 15 points per 100 possessions better with Brunson on the floor. Uh, the difference between being the number one offense and the number... Uh, the second worst offense in the league. Like, he's just so reliable, so experienced. You just cannot take away how Brunson impacts the game. Uh, he, he's an elite pick-and-roll operator. He just gets downhill. He hunts shots. He's efficient from everywhere on the floor. 
it's sad. Like, it's a great playoff formula. You know, Brunson is your lead guy. Uh, they address their biggest issue from last season, which was perimeter shooting. You know, adding guys on the wings or shooting better. Adding a guy like DiVincenzo. Adding OG. Adding Boyan. The Knicks are going to be a really tough out. Brunson is your lead guy. A great defensive team. They improve shooting. But they're probably a first or second round exit. And... With a healthy Randall, I would have told you they mopped Orlando. Orlando's not an easy out, man. Uh, if that's who they get matched up again. I think that's going to be an ugly, grimy series. An ugly, grimy series. Um, and if the Knicks survive that, they probably could just get bounced in the second round in five or six by Boston. And it's a sad reality. I Seriously, I don't mean this as hyperbole. With a healthy Julius Randall... I really thought the Knicks could compete with Boston and take them to seven or bounce them. Like, I thought they matched up really, really well with Boston. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, now that Randall isn't healthy, I, I think the Knicks are probably a safe second-round exit. I have mixed feelings about it. I mean, if they're going up against Boston round two, it's like, okay, so what yeah. are we really talking about? Mm -hmm. Because you're probably not going to go beat the title favorite out of the East unless you're 100% healthy, right? Mm -hmm. You know, championship teams, they aren't injured. They aren't missing major guys. It's just not how it goes. But I do think that they can, like, survive it and still be a very competitive team. Uh, Ananobi's obviously got to come back. Like, if he's not 100%, okay, well, then that's just too yeah. much for any team to overcome. But if he is, they've still been pretty good with Randall off the floor, and I, I think they have a, a really – functional offense outside of him obviously Brunson's still your main guy and there's a lot of guys who maybe aren't the top creators but work really hard off the ball um mm -hmm. and I, I I think the defense and the size can still hold up for him and I almost wonder if maybe leaving the is this time going to be different for Randall question unanswered could not be the worst thing in the world I'm not trying to hate um I have nothing against Randall, but hey, listen, we're good with Julius Randall. Not hate, but fair criticism. Let's be—I mean, let's show. be we real. Do lots I think, of it. I think his field goal percentage in the playoffs is like sub thirty-five percent all time. Yeah. you know, it's, oh, it's pretty ugly. ugly. His bad series are like really bad, and he's um, only had bad series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he literally has. He's been so bad in every playoff series of his career. It's only three, but he's been awful. I, I, I. I think part of the plan for the Knicks, like I get was, well, Randall has to be better this time. Like that's kind of what we're banking on mm -hmm. and we need to see that. And that now isn't a possibility for him. But I think if we're talking about, can they go beat Orlando? It's like, yeah, they still can. It'll be a tough series. It'll be ugly, yeah. but I think they work really, and it's going to be a good matchup. Orlando works so hard defensively. And I feel like the Knicks work so hard offensively and they're always moving. They're always grinding and, I'm excited to see that. So I don't think they're done necessarily. And I think they could still be annoying to the Celtics, but beating them would be pretty, pretty tough. Carson, can I get a prediction for what you think Julius Randle's true shooting percentage for his career in the playoffs is? Ooh, I'm going to say 46. Oh, my God. 46.2. Yeah, I'm that one. I'm that one. Dude, that reminds me. I got a call from Nick from BDG today. They're playing Who Wants to Be a Millionaire over there. It was right before this show. And uh, I nailed the question. It was an NFL question. I won't spoil it if anybody wants to go see that video. But let's just say I deliver under pressure. Julius Randle does not deliver under pressure, though. And I do think that it is certainly significant to the Knicks that he is out. Even though I am not a Julius Randle guy whatsoever because i do think he has some problematic tendencies offensively and he is an absurdly streaky pull-up jump shooter but he's always going to take those tough shots whether he's making them or not and he can be a ball stopper and sometimes his playmaking and decision making just fails him but i still think having that second sort of high-end shot creator when he's on what julius Randle can be having a physical mismatch attacking forward like that that is valuable to the Knicks ceiling. You are always going to have um, a bit of a pendulum swing with Randall because of how volatile and erratic he is, but it definitely raised their ceiling. I do still like what the Knicks have though. If OG comes back, which obviously is like the essential thing, it's impressive to me how competitive the Knicks have been 
without OG and Randall. I think they're 16 and 11 in games that Randall has missed this year, and most of those games are without OG as well. But when OG was out there, dude, like the Knicks clearly looked like the second team out east. They're 15 and 2 when OG plays. They have a defensive rating of 99.4 with him on the floor. Keep in mind the best defense in the league this year has a defensive rating of 108. And they had a plus 25 net rating in the minutes that he was on the floor. And he is obviously a world-class defender who was super versatile, can handle various point of attack matchups and also bring some value as a secondary rim protector. Like the guy is just a problem. He's quick, he's big, he's strong, he's got great hands, he's super long. He also really matters for this team offensively though just in terms of having another big wing, having another elite spot-up shooter, another good finisher around the rim. And overall, just that element of size has been so huge for the Knicks. It's like, we are going to bully you. That's particularly what makes them an uncomfortable matchup for a team like Boston. It's, hey, we are big, we are physical, we are going to crush you on the glass, we are going to trot out a front line of OG and Julius Randle and Isaiah Hartenstein or Mitchell Robinson. Like, that is a massive, massive team. And it's funny because now, with both OG and Randle out, they have gone like the complete opposite direction. It's like, okay, now they're starting Brunson, Deuce McBride, Josh Hart, and Dante DiVincenzo. And it's like, this team is playing small ball and shout out like Dante DiVincenzo is having a Steph Curry level shooting season. They don't want you to know the man's taking 12 and a half threes a game over the last couple months. And he's mostly yanging them and Deuce McBride. I love like his point of attack defense. He's a pest. He's a good spot up shooter. He's a good off ball player overall instinctual cutter. He's a capable secondary ball handler. I am not enamored with any team starting two small guards, but if you're going to do it, like one of them has to be a dog defensively, and Deuce McBride is that. But they need OG back if they want to be a threat. They need that size. They need that defensive ceiling. They need his offensive play finishing and fit there. And if he is back, I still like this Knicks team. No, I don't think they can beat Boston. I think that they need the ceiling that having a second star shot creator presents there. But I would definitely pick them to beat Orlando. And Brunson still has floated this offense this year, man. With Randall off the floor and Brunson on, the Knicks still have an offensive rating of nearly 120. The burden on him is just insane, though. Like, they would need him to really go nuclear to put together, like, a multiple round sort of playoff run. But with OG... They are still pretty big. They're not as big as they are with Randall. They're not as physical, but I still like how they check out in those areas. They would have an elite team defense. I think they're still a really good rebounding team. They're a really good spot-up shooting team with OG out there, which is a huge change dynamic from last year where you had very spotty spot-up shooting. RJ Barrett, Quentin Grimes went ice cold. Josh Hart went ice cold in the playoffs. Now, like when you have OG out there and you have Dante and you have Deuce McBride, and even though... Bojan hasn't been good. You have Bojan Bogdanovic. Like, there's just way more shooting, which does make life easier on Brunson because teams can't just recklessly double and trap, and he can create good shots for shooters. And they have good depth, and they have a top 15 player and an awesome star creator who I buy in. So they can still win a series if OG comes back. I don't think that they can win two, though, which is a bummer because beating Boston was always going to be really, really hard. But, like, there was a good stretch where I was like, New York very well may be the team that gives Boston the hardest series out east even over Milwaukee and I don't think they have that ceiling without Randall it, it, it's unfortunate though I wanted to ask you this this Knicks team is like pretty great you know mm -hmm. they're still sort of fringe contenders even healthy probably but they're pretty they're pretty well built yeah how would you take them to the next level this off season, like, how would you go from here? Carson, what would be Carson says, get rid of Julius. Randall. I mean, dude, like that's always going to be the ideal outcome for me is like, how do you upgrade Julius Randall to a better version of a similar archetype? Like a second shot creator who ideally does bring size. Like that's the thing. Randall provides a pretty ideal mold for a player. He's just not a good enough version of it. But I think that trading him is going to be, pretty hard to do but at that point it's kind of like you've done a great job you've almost maxed out your value in terms of like these wings I mean the value that you're getting in terms of big play from Hartenstein and hopefully Mitchell Robinson looks like himself again he's back now but he's playing very limited minutes obviously been out for a while with injury like I love the construction of that team 
but I still think they would need a more consistent second option offensively. And so maybe it is like some sort of, hey, star for star swap, but we're going to attach a little bit of draft capital to get off of Julius Randle. That's when I would be like, this team maybe could win the title if I trusted their second option. You know who You know would be a sick number two, dude? If they could, yeah. again, I don't know how you pull this deal off with Julius Randle, but like Alari Markin in, in New York, like It'd be amazing. alongside Brunson, the size, the floor spacing. Like, I think you're losing totally. a little something physicality wise, but Markin is so much longer and bigger. Like, you're not losing a Still ton. a really good positional rebounder, uh, way uh, improved rebounder from when he was dude, younger. I just imagine, like, a guy like him off ball working while Brunson's getting into the teeth of the defense. I think that would be, be a fantastic. sick duo. It'd be fantastic. Even, like, we've heard the cat to the Knicks rumors. It wouldn't be perfect, but you maintain elite size, you maintain elite rebounding, you maintain elite physicality, and now you just have, like, a second option who I think is just significantly better and more consistent than Randall. So there are avenues. It's just going to be, does anyone want to take on Julius Randall? How many years does Randall have? It can't be that many. Probably two. Next year he's under contract, and then he's got a player option the following year. I, mean, I think just two years, option. you're really not paying all that much to get off of him. I mean, you're one year sure. of Randall, and then he's an expiring. It's like, all right. And Randall's not – he's not a positive contract, I don't think, necessarily. But he's not uh, – there's there's more negative players. Oh, for sure. As I'll put it's it. not a behemoth. Um, yeah. And it's not a huge – it's not like $50 million or whatever. It's no, more no, like no. 30, right? Yeah, it's 30. I mean, and that is the concern about, like, the cat. It's like, okay, do we want to pay cat $60 million a couple years from now? Not really. That's why marketing is literally the perfect trade piece because it would only be one more year at this point, but you get him at $18 million. Like, oh, my God, you're getting a top – 30 player at 18 million dollars the jazz are the jazz are gonna ask for so much hypothetically back though man you would have to attach yeah. i think a ton i i mean i i and that's a great question matt that you bring up the contract because then you question it's like because of his playoff shortcomings because of the contract is he just a negative asset you know what i mean like how much more do you mm-hmm. have to attach to him in a hypothetical trade to get another star back because he's a star player but you know, the price point comes in, his, you know, everything factors in. I wonder if he's a, an actual negative asset. I think some, but a team like Utah would actually be excited to take on a contract like that. Like, they want to be paid to take on money. That's mm-hmm. a good thing. That's that's also in the direction they're trying to head on top of, you know, moving a star player for a bunch of draft picks. I'm trying to think about yeah. who else on marketing's level or better is, is at risk of being traded, who's a big wing guy. And it's just not... Not a lot of dudes. I mean, there's the Paul George rumblings, lot. but it would maybe kind of feel like, you know, how much longer does he have? Are you going to trade for him? And it's yeah, but I would to wind just, down for him. I would still just way rather have Paul George than Julius Randle. I would take I actually, that even if it's for a brief window. It depends on the price, of course, but it feels like you've got one big move and you left. Like the thing for mm-hmm. the Knicks to do is to make one massive you- play. I just thought of this one. This one, he's not in the exact same archetype of of Randall. What do you guys think about like? Could they get Macau Bridges? Maybe is that too much? Like I don't know. I'm trying to just think about other wing defensive guys that that can work off ball. He doesn't move the needle as much as the other guys. I just don't think he's on that same level as an offensive player. He would be a slight upgrade because of the off ball value because of what he'll bring if he's engaged defensively but i'm not in love with that as like being this is our move this is what we're gonna do so nick star talk how are they gonna land the big fish it's eternal so many future nicks who unfortunately never were but this time this time it makes sense <laughs> no and it I, does I think the paul george stuff i really do where you have to be careful is buying in on a guy who does not fit your timeline and all of a sudden like yeah Mm-hmm. George is starting to slow down, we know, but this is going to be our move anyway. We're just going to be aggressive. And then one injury happens, and all of a sudden, he's not at the level you need him to be to go win a title, and that's it. Mm-hmm. I and think with Markin, it's like you can have an injury. Like maybe the year after you make that trade, it doesn't work out, right? But you have right. multiple shots at it. I always think about those Nets teams with Kevin mm-hmm. Durant and Kyrie and Harden. It's like, dude, they just didn't have enough goes at it. It's like yeah. you, you need the injury luck, and you have to be able to roll the dice a few times on that. 
So I, I would be worried about the Knicks sort of backing themselves into a corner that way. But it wouldn't be a bad move depending on how much you had to spend. In spite of that, I think they should send Julius Randle back to L.A. to get LeBron finally. Oh, I love that. I love that. LeBron literally would be the perfect Nick, though. Like, if they had LeBron in a sort of Julius Randle role, mismatch attacking, bullying people, I mean, he's just obviously so much better at it. Knicks could be the title favorite. They could. But for now, they have Julius Randle. And uh, actually, they don't even for this season. He's hurt. So, New York, I love what you're building. It's just going to be a question of getting all those specific right pieces together and healthy. All right, let's talk about the MVP race. Matthew, I'm really interested in your thoughts on this because Logan and I already had this whole discussion early in the week. Now the ESPN MVP straw poll comes out, and so it seems like it's all but inevitable that Jokic is going to win. I think he got 90 of 100 first place votes. Do you think that's the right decision? Who is your MVP? I think my MVP is Jokic. So I do think it's the right call for the number mm -hmm. one. And I think being upset about like who's number two and who's number three, I get if it was my team, hypothetically, I guess I'd be mad. I don't really know because I'm a Hornets <laughs> fan. So yeah. I, I have no clue how I'd react if I had somebody kind of in the MVP race. Have the Hornets had somebody get an MVP vote I'm sure yeah. Kemba had some like tenth place vote, maybe. Yeah, um, yeah, maybe he was fifth on. Maybe Larry ballot. Johnson did. I, we've had somebody getting. Oh MVP yeah, I'm talking about before. in our lifetime. I mean, Zoe definitely got votes. I'm sure he was on the ballot. But I, I, I want to say that Kemba got one person voting for him one time, one year. Maybe I'm totally making that up, and I'm not saying that like, yeah, dude, Kemba was like an MVP level player, dude. He yeah, wasn't yeah. really. He was great. Let's see. But I mean, I, I think, think it would probably be did. for the 2019 season. That was his best yeah, year. Yeah, that was Dude, his, I just that found out. I just found out Al Jefferson got an MVP vote, man. What is happening? Oh. 14. Kemba did not get any in 2019. Oh, I made that up. I think Kemba <sighs> may me. Kemba may have been snubbed of that 10th place, that tied for 10th in MVP voting. Mm -hmm. Sad. Many are saying. Yeah. If it went to 10, like you could pick your top 10 as in, in your ballot, I'd be upset if not a single person put him at 10. That'd be sick. But uh, they, also didn't, they also didn't make the playoffs in 2019, so. No. I don't know. They if don't I can do that very often. <laughs> I don't know if I can blame anybody. <laughs> I think with with Jokic and with a lot of these other guys and, and, and Luka, like Shea, Giannis, they're all pretty ridiculous offensive engines. I think what separates Jokic is that he's able to create all that offensive value without the ball being in his hand all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. So he's a lot of the offense. He generates a lot without, you know, taking up so much of the possession. Mm -hmm. and, and on top of that, he's incredibly clutch because you can rely on him so much to go score at will. And he's, you know, impossible to guard because he's so big and the rebounding and his defense really isn't that bad. To me, he's still the best player in the world. And I, I don't think necessarily because Luca, who I think is kind of the number two right now or has like the clearest argument maybe, Shea being up there too and Giannis being up there too, I don't think Luca having more counting stats quite pushes him over the top. I think he's very, very good as well. Um, but I, I still lean Jokic as a more valuable player. I mean, I think you hit it on the head, dude. I called Jokic a basketball AI the other week when we were having this discussion because he's just completely optimized offense. It is just, mm -hmm. he is making the right decision. He is, and again, he doesn't need to have the ball in his hands. What really made me mad was the other day, somebody tagged us in this, Carson. Um, Gilbert Arenas' take that Jokic yeah. was, the, I mean, it's just click. It's just, cl please click on me. Please click on me and hear my bad take. Uh, yeah. Jokic is the worst MVP winner in like 30 or 40 years 40. or something like that. And it's like, wow, dude, like, do you believe anything that comes out of your mouth? Dude, Gilbert Arenas is my favorite basketball player ever. I, I loved him. He was the only relevant basketball player for the Washington Wizards for about a decade, man. Um, it's just one of the dumbest takes I've ever heard. Um, and, I mean, it's exactly that. It's like I'm not going to take away anything from Luka – for having the ball so much and leading out such a great right. offense by dominating the possession. I'm not taking anything away from him by being so dominant with the ball in his hands, but it's like in that same breath, I have to give credence to Jokic for being so effective with all the little stuff. The mm -hmm. 
the kicks in transition. And it's like, dude, Jokic never makes a bad decision. It's crazy. And then you get to the tough shot making. Like last night, dude, I didn't catch all of the Clips game. But it's like these matchups against Big Zoo where hypothetically – Maybe Big Zoo would be a deterrent, right? Because he's so strong and such a physical ma uh, matchup for Jokic. And, bro, he's getting bodied and Jokic is just throwing up. And it doesn't matter. It's going in. It's unstoppable. Like, I don't want to take anything away from Luka. And I swear to God, man, in 99% of MVP races in our lifetime, I feel like Luka is probably the clear-cut number one MVP candidate. It is ridiculous what he is doing. But when Jokic is so much more efficient and effective and he doesn't need the ball in his hands as much, I'm just going to reward that. And I just think it's, I don't know about Gill's takes. I don't know if he actually believes what he's saying. I don't know if he actually believes the words that are coming out of his mouth. Uh, I mean, I just think it's completely disrespectful. I think it completely mischaracterizes the situation. And I just wonder if people are tired of Jokic getting the nod. Um, to me, he's concretely still the best player in basketball, so I have no problem with giving him the MVP because I think he mm -hmm. deserves it. Uh, I don't really know where this narrative is coming from or if people are just tired of Jokic, but I, I, think, it's, I think it's clearly his award, man. This is, this is it before I think it becomes nearly impossible for, for Jokic to get it done without doing something superhuman MVP-wise. There's only so many times you can rack him up before... Mm -hmm. People just get tired. It's like, it's like it's the to... LeBron effect. Is the LeBron effect, man? It, it, you know, it happened to LeBron. Yo, it wow, did. you set him up it for did. that one. It did. It did happen to LeBron, <laughs> no, of, course. of course. But it happens to a lot of guys where it's like they'll be as good as they were the year before, but it's like we've already given them two. So it's like either do something <laughs> new, do something particularly special, or it's like we're just going to put you at like third. And I, and I agree with Luca. It sucks because like it's like one of those Harden years where he would put up crazy stats and carry – um, mm -hmm. uh, a ton in the regular season, but the difference is that Luke is probably going to like rise in the playoffs. Oh yeah. That's, that's, that's the difference between those two. Um, and to not reward that with an MVP and for him to never have an MVP is crazy, but it's, it's a tight race and I have to give it, I have to give it to Jokic. Yeah. This is a truly incredible historic season that Luca is having. He just gets better year after year after year. And the most significant thing this year has been his significant improvement as a three-point shooter and how just lethally efficient he has been from beyond the arc. It makes him legitimately unguardable. So I think he is an honorable second. Jokic is my MVP. And the reason for that is just that I think he transforms team offense more completely than anybody on the planet. Luka is completely amazing. He is a spectacle to watch. Out of pick and roll, he is going to pick you apart, right? He can force a switch and go to work in isolation on a mismatch. He can make every pass in the book. He's an incredibly versatile shot maker, this great physical force. He changes pace, decelerates more effectively than anybody on the planet. Like, the dude is a master of offensive scoring and of passing. But I made this point on the show Monday, and I do think that it matters. When you look at the context of these guys' respective teams, Luka is more replaceable. That is not to say at all that he is replaceable. But when you take him off the floor, the Dallas Mavericks have an elite pick-and-roll shot creator and shot maker, an elite isolation shot creator and shot maker. That man is Kyrie Irving. And that's the reason that when Luka goes to the bench, the Mavs still have an offensive rating that is equivalent when Kyrie is on to when Luka is on the floor. They're a really good offense either way. And compared to Jokic, what he does is completely irreplicable. He has such a completely unique skill set that his team falls apart without him. And also, I think you make a great point about how he completely dictates the game and leads to this great offense without having to dominate the ball and also without going to these repetitive play types where it's, all right, we're going to run pick and roll. I'm going to be on the ball the entire game out of isolations. Like, I saw some people after our show on Monday be like, oh, so it's a play style preference? No, it's not a play style preference. It is what is most effective. People seem to just ignore the fact that it is important that you bring value away from the ball. That is how you empower your teammates to thrive, right? These guys who mm -hmm. are effective with their ball in the hands, when you stress the defense away from the ball, that makes everything run more smoothly. It also matters that you are an elite screener, right? Which Jokic is going to do. I think it fundamentally just matters that you are thoughtful 
of keeping your other teammates in rhythm, of playing a style that empowers them to move without the ball and incentivizes them to do so. Like, that's just how you optimize team offense. And then also, he literally physically gets what he wants at will, and he's the best touch shot maker that we've ever seen. So it's extremely easy for him to create great offense all the time. But off-ball value matters. Efficiency matters. Versatility matters. And Jokic is checking all those boxes perfectly more perfectly than Luka like we're comparing all-time great offensive players but I do think there's a reason that Jokic is like probably number one and Luka isn't quite there yet I'm talking all time and just some of the narratives that persist about Jokic blow my mind dude like Logan you mentioned the Gill take I think that there's a certain point at which like there's no value in rebutting a take right it's like when Nick Wright said that he was the worst MVP since Dave Cowens you just kind of go okay like you shrug, it's like, there's no conversation to be had there. Like, what are you talking about? But there are still legitimately people out there who are like, the Nuggets are juicing his on-off numbers. His on-off numbers are juiced by these lineup combinations. And it's like, you can go through all of the various combinations with Murray on the floor and Jokic off. The Nuggets have an offensive rating of 106. With Jokic on and Murray off, they have an offensive rating of 119, 13 point swing. With MPJ on and Jokic off, offensive rating of 110. With Jokic on, MPJ off, offensive rating of 123, 12 and a half point swing. With AG on, Jokic off, they have an offensive rating of 110. With Jokic on, AG off, they have an offensive rating of 125, 15 point swing. It's like, guys, it doesn't matter who you put him alongside. The shot quality that he creates no matter what is unbelievable. You see it last night in that Clippers game. Like, there is not a capable ball handler or shot creator on the floor for the Nuggets. Reggie Jackson has his moments. Like, he had a good stretch earlier this year. He also has these stretches where you're like, bro, what are you doing? It's like, hey, Reggie, that's Victor Wemanyama two feet away. Maybe don't try to put up the floater. It's not even going to get out of your hands. Reggie, maybe don't jack up the tough pull-up three early in the shot clock. So then you can't even close with him, and it's like, cool. Okay, this guy is our point guard. He is bringing the ball up the floor. He's also the most devastating post player in the game. He's the best scorer in the game. He's the best passer in the game. He's doing everything. I mean, he had 36, 17, and 10 last night on really good efficiency. And he's 89 and 54 without Jamal Murray since 2020. That is a 51 win pace. And you think about the fact that their best ball handler, their best like quote unquote point guard in that stretch has been Monte Morris and still... Jokic is able to carry the offense to the extent where you are winning at the clip of like a damn good playoff team. That's unbelievable. The year without Jamal Murray, right? Jokic's MVP season in 2022. They played as a better team with Jokic on the floor than all the other MVP contenders with their much more talented teams. I just don't get how we're still even having these conversations. I don't know how anybody can resist the fact that Jokic is the best offensive player on the planet right now. He's the best player overall. And... He's just optimized offense, man. He plays a style that is ideal for floor raising and ceiling raising. He can do everything that you could want from him at an incredibly high level. Luka makes a really good MVP case. He does because this is historic raw production. And uh, the Mavs are particularly as of late playing really good basketball, really good offensive basketball. But I do believe Jokic is more completely irreplaceable. I think he's better, and if we're applying the traditional MVP standard, he's on the better team, and that does matter. And that's even surviving the absence of Murray that's without like this overwhelming talent advantage the Nuggets are really good but they are entirely built around Jokic right like they have these good play finishers who if you take him off the floor it doesn't matter because their shot quality just isn't good enough so he's still my MVP Carson basically just said you could throw Jokic out there with some LA fitness hoopers and they would create some good offense and man. they've they done it before literally. and it's happened yeah they did it yeah <laughs> I mean 2022 they did that bro like, that was a ridiculous team. I mean, you can go down, dude, any, any run, and I know he got criticized for, you know, not getting out of this round or whatever, bro, but it's, like you said, dude, it's Will Barton, it's Austin Rivers, it's Monte Morris, it's Faku. Like, bro, those teams shouldn't be remotely competitive, man. Yeah. They've never done anything other than than meet or exceed expectations in the playoffs when they've had Jokic. Like, yeah, there's been some years where they get to the conference finals and – they lose to the Lakers, and it's like, well, the Lakers were just the better team. Like, they were the heavy favorite. Like, they didn't match up. And then you go to the Warriors. It's like, yeah, they lost to the Warriors. Won the title. It's like, 
they yeah. weren't going to go win that playoff series because everybody was hurt. Yeah. Um, and then, Th- you know, they go the and win the title stuff. or whatever. So it's, it's, I get why it's a debate. I, I think Luca has a fair argument. No player is ever going to be as good as Luca is right now and have the season that he is and not be in MVP conversations or be like, he's of getting course. screwed. Never has happened once. And Mavs fans are right too. And if I was a Mavs fan, like I said, I'd be pissed. Um, mm-hmm. but I, I, I still think it's Jokic. Yeah. And I do want to give props to like what Luca has done as a floor raiser. I always think back to his second year in the league, bro. He led the best offense in basketball and it was really just like that. Well, they had young Brunson running that second unit, but it was mostly just like capable spot up shooters, capable rim runners. Luca as a ball dominant force can carry you to be at such a high floor. But in terms of ceiling raising, when you're talking about scale alongside really good players, I do prefer Jokic because of his play style, his fundamental selflessness as a basketball player, his versatility. It is close between the two of them. But what's just kind of upsetting me right now is like this devaluing of Jokic doing the most important thing in basketball, which is going on an all-time great playoff run. Like, you guys all had your takes about, oh, it's the calculator boys. It's, oh my God, his VORP, his BPM are so crazy. And for what it's worth, I've been the biggest Jokic advocate for five years. I've never once cited his BPM or his VORP. I think single number metrics suck. You can't capture the complexity of a basketball player with one number. So just put that aside. You've never needed those sort of advanced stats to make the Jokic case. I think impact stats, like how great his team is with him on the floor versus off it, tell a story. And some people can't wrap their head around those numbers. But then he goes out there by every single possible measure, has a historic run in the most important stage And then, like, people are still trying to diminish that. I still see people acting like his only case for best player in the world is these analytics. And I shouldn't even engage with that stuff. But it's just, like, crazy to me. Because, Logan, you mentioned people getting tired of Jokic, and that's how this stuff is starting. Who has ever had the shorter window of, like, okay, we'll tolerate this guy's the best. Let's give him his flowers. Everybody was shitting on Jokic completely undeservedly which peaked in early April of last year before he went on this historic run. So he has had less than a year where he's doing this all-time great stuff and we can all acknowledge it without like certain people being like, I'm done with that guy. He sucks now. That's just kind of annoying to me. I just think people are so... I think people are so used to LeBron being the best. (laughs) Yeah, honestly. That's what I was just going to say, bro. It's, 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 It's... just such a new experience for them i yeah. understand if there's some growing pains with that uh but no yeah. I, I i i can't disagree Jokic is best player in the world pretty i don't want to say pretty easily but i i think pretty clearly and he's a special player to watch and he's a lot of fun to watch man mm-hmm. um so I, I don't know how people people don't get it yeah and i think most people do and i think most of the anti Jokic stuff is just driven by like these stand bases now where it's like guys Giannis and Luka and Jokic are all all all-time great players it'd be nice if we could appreciate all of them because they're all having unbelievable seasons in their own way career seasons in their own way Giannis is having his best offensive season ever and it's always just like eh how can I diminish that guy that's lame the thrill and excitement of March Mania is here in DraftKings Sportsbook one of America's top rated sportsbook apps is giving new customers a shot to turn five bucks into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet and North Carolina listeners don't forget DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in your state download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code nerds new customers can bet five bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code nerds the crown is yours but you mentioned LeBron Matt and since we have mm-hmm. you on I thought it'd be yeah. nice to give you a little segment to talk about your La Sunshine your La Glorious King I thought that mm-hmm. might make you smile it will. and again I'm specifically interested in your take on this because Logan and I did our top 10 playoff players last week so I know where I fall on this I know where he falls on this how many players would you take over LeBron for None. a playoff run this year okay and not a single one I mean <laughs> Here's the thing. Like, is Jokic better? Yeah, but mm. does winning a title mean anything to me if it's not if it's not with LeBron? I have to say, no, it wouldn't mean much. Mm. Realistically, 
I don't know. I think LeBron's much improved shooting from last year is a pretty big deal. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, it was really horrifyingly bad down the stretch in the <laughs> playoffs. Uh, so I, I was getting worried that maybe it wasn't all the foot or maybe like this is just kind of where we were. And that's clearly mm-hmm. not the case. I have some questions about like how consistent he can be compared to some of these other younger guys. That's a big thing with dudes getting older. It's not that they lose it entirely, particularly a player like LeBron, who at this point is like a lot more strength than he is like speed. Mm-hmm. But is he going to go out and like Luca maybe go 35 every night for multiple series? I just don't know if he has that in the tank. And of course, this is not me slandering LeBron. You know, I don't know if anybody <laughs> has ever had that in the tank ever in the history of basketball. But he'd still be pretty high, man. And I mean, he moves the ball well. He's not the greatest off-ball player in the world, but if he's shooting really well, at least he can be a, a lot of a threat. I guess I'd have him right around 10, 11. Mm, interesting. Maybe. Interesting. I, I'm, 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 I'm trying to you think about You are lower who... on your goat than I am. Do you want to go through? We can go through case Yeah, why don't, why don't we do go through it? I'm trying to... So I All think right, like I got... the... The non-negotiables above LeBron. You tell mm-hmm. me if you take issue with any of these. Jokic, Giannis, Luke, as we've discussed. I think SGA. Yeah. I think Embiid. I mean, this year, like maybe if he doesn't look fully like himself, but just the ceiling, right? When you talk about carrying a team, there's a total. The Embiid one, there. we could get into the the health debate, but let's right. we, if, let's just let's just give it to Embiid. Yeah. If we're presuming health. And you're saying, okay, I need a guy to have the ceiling as a number one option for us to go far. Like, what Embiid is capable of, the guy who scores 35 a night efficiently and dominates defensively, that's just a different level than LeBron. When we did our rankings, I had Steph and Kawhi above LeBron. I stand by both of those. I still think that what Steph uh, does, the burden that he carries offensively as an engine there. Like, again, he's had some off nights recently. And I do think he's taken a step back from last year. I still think it's like, if you're telling me over a run, I need this guy to carry the load for me offensively, I would take Steph. And Kawhi, I just think, is like so brutally efficient and still so good defensively and so consistent there. I would take those guys. So do you agree with those seven to start? I think I agree with Curry. I know I agree with Kawhi. I guess maybe I have some concerns where it's like Curry – is not the greatest like on ball when we're talking about, you know, the top, top guys. And it's like, is he as consistent with that? And, you know, being a little bit more, you know, three based and the, the inside shot, not the inside Mm -hmm. shot, but uh, getting to the rim has really started to leave him. And it's like, do I want that inconsistency versus LeBron? But the off ball stuff, I I think, I think that's, I think they're on the same tier right now is, is, is what I would say. I think that's fair. I do think even though Steph again, has been particularly relying on the deep ball, as you mentioned this year, and has been particularly limited in pressuring the rim. Like, if you think about what he was able to do last year in the playoffs, and even the year before that, he hasn't really been pressuring the rim at uh, even like 10% of his shots coming at the rim. And he is still picking people apart with what he does out of pick and roll. Mm -hmm. Obviously changing the dynamics offensively completely with what he does off ball. I still lean Steph. I do think it's a conversation, though, just because, I mean, LeBron shooting at this level with his physical dominance. Yeah, no, go ahead. Say whatever. <laughs> Say whatever you're just because just, just, just LeBron is just LeBron, and how can you not? Just because LeBron. Okay, so that's it I, for me. I had LeBron at number eight. At that point, I was like, yes, he cannot carry the load over a playoff run, maybe even of like a Jason Tatum. But the highs that I'm getting from LeBron, they're just, okay, this game I'm going to pick you apart, right? I'm going to hunt a mismatch every single time, and you can't stop me out of the post. I'm either going to bully you or I'm going to make the perfect read, and I'm going to knock down 40% of my threes, and when I want to, I'm going to be a great on-ball creator out of pick and roll in isolation, and when I want to, I'm going to be a super impactful low man defensively and a great defensive rebounder. Like, the single-game peaks that we saw from LeBron last year, even when he wasn't right, when it was like, okay, this game really right. matters. Game six against the Warriors, cool. I'm just like by far the best player on the floor. Game four against the Nuggets, if Jokic wasn't a superhero, like I would have single-handedly carried us to that game. Mm-hmm. We're seeing just a better LeBron this year than last year. A healthier LeBron, a much better I, jump shooting LeBron. I, I, I think I agree. I think last year maybe he would be in that 10 range because yeah, of last the year, shooting. 
And yeah. then Cl- this year, it's like, okay, well, if you buy that, he's really just going to shoot like 40% from three. That's got to move mm-hmm. him up. There's other dudes there like Tatum, I, 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 right. I do think is, is, is right there. And I might have Tatum over him still. Um, think about some of the Phoenix guys as well are mm-hmm. definitely Grayson Allen. Right, right, Bradley Beal. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think I think eight is fair. It's incredible. It really is. It is. He's forty, dude. man. It's stupid. Okay, Matt, so is I, I want to get your gauge on. I had AD over LeBron. Where do you? I don't think come that's a crazy on, on that take. Debate? I don't think that's a crazy take. Yeah. The problem is like it's so hard to judge him compared to like okay if we're talking about LeBron and Kevin Durant. Like, I'm not saying they're the same player defensively, but, like, really what we're looking at is, like, okay, who do you trust more to be your number one guy in the playoffs offensively and be the guy initiating and creating? With Anthony Davis, okay, well, I can tell you for a fact if your number one offensive option is Anthony Davis and you don't have, like, another, like, sort of, like, 10, 15 range guy, like, that's just not going to work. He's not nearly consistent enough. But the defense is incredible. When the Lakers won their championship, it was largely because Anthony Davis's incredible defense. So how do you balance that? Like, would I want to go try to find another top-tier dude? Or I don't know. It's a difficult yeah. one. So I, I think tough. I get it. I, I do get it. It's it's a lot like, um, I don't want to say it's exactly like this, but it's kind of like ranking Draymond all time or whatever, where it's like, it's just so... Like his his skill set and his value is just so different from a lot of other players that, like the defense first guys are just always hard to rank in anything I guess. But I I yeah. see the vision. I do. I'd go with LeBron though. The thing with AD is when he wants to be, when he is engaged and when he's being aggressive and when his touch shot making is going, like he can be a dominant offensive player, dominant he can. offensive player. But it's just too inconsistent. He's so. really inconsistent with it, man. Well, like. Look, multiple so. multiple like well this can't be your number one guy you'll lose games a series right 100 percent. so i agree with your point like 80 is an offensive number one just doesn't work at this stage at the same time i do think like over the course of a season he carries the lakers more than lebron because of just how he dominates defensively but when i think about all right fully dialed in lebron in a playoff environment i just trust him more in those single game settings and then it's like kind of Katie and Book outside of Tatum are the only guys in that tier. And it sounds like you're taking LeBron over both. So I have LeBron at eight. You have LeBron at eight. Logan, where did you have LeBron? At seven. seven? Okay. So he's somewhere in that range, which is insane, dude. Insane. Like, you know where I fall on the GOAT debate for now, Matthew. You do. But yeah. you are looking with an intensity in your eyes. I'm just, I'm just, it's insane. Yeah, That's all I'll say it's. And what yeah, I'm keep gonna it, say keep it in here, your pants, Bonauer. Yeah, we're gonna cut <laughs> away just, from the camera for a I'm minute just... here. I no. wonder, man, at what point is the longevity just more important? Because it, it's not like peak matters more than longevity forever. When the peak is pretty damn close, and it's like if LeBron does this shit for another two years, man, it would be weird because it's like. Obviously, these aren't the most significant years of LeBron's career. It's not like he has a crowning achievement, but it's like, is there just a point where the totality of it mm. is so overwhelming? The I was going to say his among catches active up to MJ, players, man. bro. Dude, his ranks among active players, he's obviously first in points. He's first in assists. He's first in rebounds. Or no, he's second in assists to CP3. He's second in steals. And he's like even top 10 in blocks. It's just utterly unfathomable and after last year like he wasn't playing like a top 10 player in that playoff run i would say he was playing like a top 15 player who had some great moments but i think he's undeniably back in there with how he's playing right now it's disgusting matt when did when did lebron surpass jordan for you like when was it like well i mean maybe it was when you first set your eyes on lebron but like when was it like concrete for you? a young matthew spawn hour i was in october I, I believe... of 2003 <laughs> Against the I Sacramento came out Kings. Of, of the womb in the in the in the Brian High jersey. LeBron. I'm afraid. High school, the I had Saint the Saint Vincent jersey. Yeah, I had the Saint Vincent. I don't know exactly when. I mean, to be completely honest with you, uh, my dad's from Ohio. I live in Ohio. Uh, that 2016 Finals run, I'm like, okay, well, this is the greatest moment in North American sports, pretty much. This is like straight up like hero's journey. 
incredible mm-hmm. comeback against the best team ever. Like, I mean, I, it's, it really is. And I, I stand by that. It's the greatest moment in North American sports professionally. You know, Secretariat. Have you ever seen Secretariat? Oh, at, what was it? Horses. Belmont? And that, you know what? I made a video about that. And that's the same thing that people said. They said, what about Secretariat? It's like, shout out to it. It's a horse. It's okay? hilarious. This is not, this is not what we're. Th- <laughs> Dude, I will say, though. My like best friend's dad was talking about how watching Secretariat win that race moved him to tears. And I was like, what are you talking about? It is crazy, though. I mean, that horse is way faster than the other horses, man. Way faster. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, I cry almost every Lakers game, so I do get it a little bit. <laughs> no, but I, I agree with your point a lot, Carson, about the yeah. longevity overcoming the peak. What a lot of people do in the GOAT debate is they're like, well, there's two things. There's longevity and there's peak. And what's more valuable is peak. So mm-hmm. I think Jordan's peak is a little bit higher, so I think he's the GOAT. And I get that. Uh, I don't know if I necessarily agree that Jordan's peak was was all that much higher, if higher at all. But uh, I think close. people look at it as they have to pick one and then mm-hmm. argue for that one. And it's really a balance. And the way that I personally balance it is this. If you were a general manager and you could have either Michael Jordan or LeBron James for the entirety of their career on your team, who would you pick? Because as a GM, you're taking into account how good were they at their peak and you're taking into account how long, how many opportunities you'll have to Mm -hmm. build around them. I think, I think honestly, LeBron like is the easy, no brainer choice in that situation. I don't even think it's... Logan disagrees. This dude, bro, the no brainer choice. I think... I think in that situation you take him handedly, man. I, I mean, he's you're getting you're getting like an extra like eight years of. We're, we're, that's that's the thing. It's why his longevity is so important. He's not just around a long time. He's not putting up like 15 points a game. He could genuinely be the best player on a title team right now in year mm-hmm. what 21, 22. Well, and let me ask it you this: It would require it, an exceptional, exceptional team around him for him to be the best player. He could we're, we're talking about oh, no, no, no we, 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 did, we just we just had a conversation about Laurie Markkinen making the Knicks yeah. a contender. So well, is Jalen yeah. is Jalen Brunson what like a top eight, top seven player? No, but I would say the Knicks with Larry Markkinen that's a pretty exceptionally good basketball team. Maybe maybe that's fair, but I, I think I think LeBron <laughs> is still pretty high. Pretty high. He's up number there, eight. And honest, me. And, and, he's number eight. Okay. We just said it. So so here here's my question: If the Lakers had never traded for Westbrook, do you think they'd be contending right now? If they yes. still had yes. had Caruso and Kuzma and okay and KCP, I don't think that's such yeah. an insane team. It's not that it's it, like you can't call him a, a, a no. But title they, he, he one. does he does have pretty much a co number one with Anthony Davis. Like fair enough. Having two top ten players is pretty cracked on its Matt, own and the lakers this, have messed up some stuff around them but like that's a really good formula you can never be out on the lakers because they have that in both of these hypotheticals do i get them for they could you never them, leave me they could you never get them, leave me. they can never leave you because like that people would be like well lebron might leave it's like well that's not really like what we're talking about yeah, like, yeah i point. guess that's not but like that's not the point you also get them within their own era which kind of makes it a, a little weird but like if you say Michael That's Jordan, do he it. doesn't have to play in 2023, and then it's like, well, he's 3.3 isn't that good? Like, all right, that's, <laughs> that's not how that works. I mean, um, the only thing I disagree with is you saying that it's a clear no-brainer because I think Jordan's so much more of, like, just an exceptionally dominant takeover scorer. That's the only distinction that I – like, it, when I want a game iced, when I want a game put to bed – I want Jordan. I want the guy that's going to slam the door. I do think it's a debate, and if I'm getting him for the entirety of the career, the longevity really does factor in. I, oh I, my God, I'm getting it's it's such a big difference. I just don't think even a slight Jordan Pete can overcome it. Mm-hmm. But it's I, I, maybe 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 it's not an, any a no brainer. I mean, it, I've been no, but debating that's a, it so long. I've I've got to mm-hmm. say, but I think I, that's 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 how I look at. It. If I had someone said. Mm-hmm. Why is LeBron the GOAT? That is what I would say. I would take him before any other player. And maybe uh, we, we could go back and forth about who peaked exactly higher, but I think the longevity is just such a big chasm. And I almost feel like you either have to think that Michael Jordan was leagues better than LeBron at his best, or you have to be like, longevity just doesn't matter. Because it is there, there's got to be either a huge gap making up for it for Jordan, or you don't care about longevity. Yeah. There is just something strange, though, about saying, I don't think this guy 
is the best player in the history of this sport when you are talking about peak, which is ultimately most important. And yet I think he is the greatest. Like there is just a little bit of dissonance there, but I'm not disagreeing with you. Like, I don't know how we got to the goat debate here. I started this one. This is my fault. It's just incredible. It's some of the greatest longevity that we've seen in sports ever from a guy who also has undeniably a top two peak in the history of his sport. And longevity does matter. It's like, I'm not going around calling Nikola Jokic a top 10 player of all time, even if I think he is a top 10 peak. Right. Because they're just guys who achieved more over the breadth of their careers, right? Because Nikola Jokic just turned 29 years old. So it's interesting. And uh, I could see my mind changing on that. Like, I am not this immutable Jordan is the goat forever and ever. I, I do think that trying to diminish what he did is lame. And we're not done with the 90s over here. We're never going to be done with the 90s or the 80s or the 70s. Eh, we're, a little, we're a little done with the 90s. No, we're not. No, we're not. Because let me we, tell we you We might diminish Matt. Jordan a little. No, 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 no. When that all happened, the most shocking part to me, maybe not shocking, but amusing, was it's like, oh, cool. These guys think they just dropped the footage for 90s basketball. I had somebody who was like, this guy has said that MJ is the GOAT. Let's see how he responds to this. It's like, guys, I've watched MJ before. I know what 90s basketball looked like. It wasn't as good as basketball today because that's what happens in every single sport. Skill gets better. Strategy gets better. Medicine gets better, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You judge people against their t peers. Anyways, let's move on. Let's talk about the other LeBron James because he's got some news today. Brawny is declaring yes. for the draft and also entering the transfer portal. It's a LeBron question, so we're going to start with you, Matt. What's your reaction to that? I think he's probably going to go back, right? I mean, he didn't have the greatest freshman year. Um, no, he did not. I th I think he can be a good NBA player. I'm not one of these guys who are like, he sucks. I always feel like a little weird about the people who like really want to make a point about how much Bronny sucks, and it's like, okay. You know, they're not, it's not like people are talking about him like a, a potential top five pick right now or anything. Um, I, I'm a little worried that in a weak draft class with the situation being that if you draft Bronny, do you get LeBron? Well, I'm sitting here at 25 and I'm a contender. I, I'm going to roll those dice. Why not? Sure. And then Bronny's like, I'm going to take advantage of that now. And I'm going to come out and we'll just figure out the development later. I don't know if that would be very good for him. And more importantly, I honestly think that once Bronny is in the NBA, LeBron's retirement could very possibly be imminent. And I really, I want to see if he can get to like, you know, like 23, 24, 25 seasons. His big thing it feels like that's left to do is, is play with his son, which would be just such a yeah. ridiculous accomplishment and the ultimate cherry on top to uh, the best career ever. Yeah. So I want I I want Bronny to be good. I'd like him to take him a little bit longer in college, so we maybe get a few more LeBron years. And I think it would be better for him, to be completely honest. Although, how high you would draft him? I I, I was actually thinking about this a lot today. How do you think that situation would play out? Let's say that Bronny is coming out, which I think he won't. Although I mm -hmm. I guess I don't know. It's just a gut feeling. Let's say that he comes out this year. How does that go down? Is it LeBron? trying to like pull the strings to get him to LA or is LeBron then going to wherever he goes? Because I don't think LeBron wants to leave LA that no. much, but it doesn't really make sense for Bronny to like go there. I think that would just be such a disaster. And it's almost a shame. Like personally, what I want to have happen is one of these contenders to be like, we're getting Bronny and LeBron, you got to come here. And then he goes there and then you know, we get ring number five. And they hold, seven. they hold Bronny <laughs> hostage, man. Yeah, they, they, I don't, they, I don't think anything like them. that is going to happen, dude. I just think it's too much of an unknown. And I really don't think it's like if the Utah Jazz were like, we're going to overdraft Bronny. LeBron is not going to play for them. I, I don't think he's leaving LA. Mm -mm. I think... If but what Bronny if it was a good team? And what if it was a later pick? I don't think it's that crazy. I don't think it's a crazy idea at all. I know people will be like, I'm going to spend the number one over pick on Bronny. It's like, okay, that's not going to happen. Not going to happen. But in a really bad draft class, and this is a really bad draft class, if you're a contender sitting at like pick 28 or pick 27 
or maybe I don't know, maybe you're like the Thunder and you have a million picks or whatever, and one of them's kind of late. And the overdraft isn't like a lottery pick, but it's like high second or late first when maybe he's more like a mid second guy. I think that's totally worth it. And I, I would really consider doing it if you honestly thought you could get LeBron to go there. Or you honestly thought that maybe you could get the Lakers to overpay to get him because LeBron wants him. But I don't know yeah. if they'd be willing to do that or if they'd be like, dude, screw you. We're not doing that. I, I just think it's an interesting situation. I feel like that would be more likely. Like the actual Bronny hostage situation. Like, okay, you got to give us two firsts to get your son so you guys can play together. But it's still just like too weird. I don't know. We've never seen anything like this. It's just, it's just, it's, and, but it's like LeBron is like kind of like he gets the GM stuff and he yeah. could just go wherever and play for minimum because he, you know, he has like a billion dollars, but True. he really wants to be in LA. Like, I don't know, man. It's just, it'd be a, it'd be a, a great drama yeah. segment. It would. I don't think anybody is drafting Bronny and then getting LeBron is what I'll say. And I, I think doing that Probably would be not. a mistake. I mean, the issue I take with that is I just think that Bronny is not an NBA player. I'm not hating on him. I don't think Bronny is remotely close to being a rotation player in the league today. And so the fact that we're pitching him playing with LeBron, the key word there is playing. If Bronny gets drafted by any NBA team, he's going to the G League. Bronny is not ready for NBA That would be NBA the funniest basketball. thing in the world. It's like the Thunder draft him. Finally, LeBron goes over there for the minimum, and they just send him down. I mean, yeah. just, well, that's a great point, yeah. Logan. That's a great point. He is 1,000% going. If he stays in this draft, which I don't think he'll do because he's simply no. not ready, he is going to the G League for one year, if not multiple years. And so then LeBron's not playing with him. It's just like he's in the same state. You know, it's like, oh, my God, the Warriors took him. Yeah, with the Santa Cruz Warriors, maybe a couple hours away. It's not really the same draw. Yeah, I mean, I just think he needs a, a few more years to get better in college before he's, even if he's, because I'm telling you, like, he's just, he's not an NBA guy right now. I think he needs a few more years to marinate. And then, I, like, and don't get me wrong, too, I think it would be super cool. Like, you know, Ken Griffey Jr. and Ken Griffey Sr., it'd be awesome. I mean, it would just fill your heart up. You know, I mean, it would it, it would mm -hmm. be so awesome to see the two on the court together. Um, I mean, I feel like it's every, it's everybody's dream, man. You can play with your dad. That's awesome, dude. That's so much fun. But, uh, it, Bronny has to get leagues better. And and I think the best thing for him is leave USC, get out of the spotlight of California, go somewhere where you can get legitimate real reps in playing time. Um, you know, I'm USC talking USC sucks though. USC yeah, sucks. Yeah, and, and that's what's and that's what's crazy too is it's like USC is not that good and Bronny's not exactly. Like Bronny I think needs to go somewhere else and just get get burned, man. I I don't think he's remotely close to the talent or caliber of being drafted or just skill level at this point in his young career. I just think he needs more time. Um, I do want to see them overlap, though. I think, you know, we've been talking about this for so long. This has been a story for, I mean, what, dude, three, four years now? Like, I would feel a little bit short-changed or a little bit robbed if we don't ever get the overlap. But um, I, I just think the the primary issue is just the fact that Bronny's not anywhere close to being ready for the league yet. Yeah, I agree. And uh, I don't think that he has that great of prospects as an NBA player long-term, to be honest. Like, I don't want to rule it out, but he needs to develop significantly more in college. And like, you see moments from him, right? I would say that he's uh, a pretty solid point of attack defender. I think he's a capable decision maker. He's been a decent pull-up shooter this year. He's also been an awful shooter off the catch. He's um, got decent size for a guard. He's a decent athlete. But like in terms of NBA traits, there's nothing that Bronny is really doing as a high level as a prospect right now. So if he grows into a more significant role and it's like, okay, we see this guy really has pick and roll chops and that playmaking gets better and that pull up shooting becomes a consistent weapon. Then maybe it could happen, but right now it's like he's just kind of an okay college role player for a school that wasn't even good. So to draft him at this point, I mean, it would just be nonsensical. It's like you're talking about years of development that would just be better spent in college 
instead of like, oh, I'm going to be a G League role player. It's like, no, try to develop your on-ball game. Try to uh, try to take on a more significant role somewhere in college. Yeah, I can't disagree. It's going to so, happen, though. You think it's going to happen that they play together? Dude, I think let so. me tell you something. Actually, I do, I do, I do think they're going to play together. I think I, – I, don't disagree with anything we've said here about like the ridiculousness of okay, well Bronny is like not even close right now. I think he could get yeah. there. I think luckily he doesn't have a play style that's like, dude, we you you need to be kind of more of a connective piece at this point and you're not that. Like that's that's the one thing. It's not like he's like just an inefficient shot creator where it's like, ah, it's really yeah, not gonna No, fly. for sure. He's got the right mentality as a basketball but player. But I think if I think if he gets even close, man, and, and and LeBron is still kicking in like three years, let's say he goes through all of his college and Yeah, dude, I absolutely I think LeBron will be like, please get him in the second round and we're gonna play a few games. I do. That would be awesome, but I do not want Bronny to come out this year for that to happen. I want LeBron to no. stick around no, as I'm long saying, as possible, man. Let's get let's get twenty let's get twenty four years of Braun, bro, and then he'll be the goat indisputably, and I'll be happy and I'll embrace that because I just love basketball, man. At the end of the day, and that's why I'm better than everybody else in the goat debate <laughs> because I just love basketball. Can't we just say that they're kind of all the goats in their own way? Well, they're the goats of everything. Think about like, it. Tim Duncan is the goat because he stayed with one team for his whole career and is the ultimate winner. Bill Russell is the goat for the same reason. Kareem is the GOAT because he changed his name. Charles Barkley is the GOAT because he told people that he's not a role model. Why can't we just appreciate all of them? Dude, what if the real GOATs were the friends we made along the way, fellas? I'm starting to think basketball fans don't even like basketball, man. <laughs> Dude, oh God. Oh God. Yo, this was the funniest season ever, bro. I swear. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Enough of that. Enough of that brain rot. But have you guys seen what's going on with the TikTok Riz party? Are you guys in the loop on that? I'm incredibly in the loop on that, man. It's, okay, it's awesome, right? You guys, did we you guys were... get your invite in the mail the other day? Do you even know what we're talking about, you boomer millennial scum? Look, I may Do have you been even born know about in... Turkish Quandale Dingle? Look, I may have been born in 1940, but... Do you know about the group leader, a.k.a. Blue Tie Kid? Uh, I mean, I saw... I was there, bro. I got my... I'm asking, did you guys get your invite? I was there. I don't think you've seen a TikTok Riz party video. I was literally there, bro. Who are you? You're not Tomato Boy. I wasn't in the video. I was in the back looking all cool. You, you were up filming. against the wall. Yeah. You were filming. I was not the cameraman. That's just slander. <laughs> uh, then it's weird that you were hanging out with a bunch of 15-year-olds at the TikTok Riz party. <laughs> it's not something to be attended. It's something I, to be observed and analyzed. I feel... My, my, my thought on it, I feel absolutely terrible for those poor kids, bro. <laughs> Do you like, think it's a bad thing? I think, I think, like, with the analyzing of, like, how, like, who is, like, trying to, like, what approval yeah. of who, it's like, oh, that yeah. would be, that happened to me when I was 15, I might lose my mind. However, it is a pretty funny video, unfortunately. It's funny. And me, me and my friends were thinking, would it be funny to make a video being like, I'm Tomato Boy's older brother, please stop making, <laughs> please stop making fun of him. Yeah. But... I, I haven't really? seen anything from any of them. I, 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 I am tapped into the, the yeah. Riz lore, the TikTok Riz party lore. That's good. It would, I mean, it would be pretty funny, bro. You get like a job interview and they pull that MF up at it. Like, was this Turkish you at the TikTok Bingo. Riz party? Dude, are you, dude, are you too <laughs> <laughs> Sir, can you explain why you were trying to impress the group leader when you dug it at this point in the TikTok <laughs> Riz party? I think the deeper they get into the analysis, the better it gets, man. That's my take. And honestly, I'm not sure it'd be the worst thing. I agree with you. Maybe it goes a little bit deep, but it would also just be, like, hilarious. It's a hilarious concept. And it if is. if I were a kid, I'd laugh about it. Because I'm better than everybody else, and I have a sense of humor about That's true. myself. You're right. Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging it. All right. Honestly, let's quickly hit on this one, and then let's get to the J. Cole Kendrick debate. <laughs> Caitlin mm -hmm. Clark plays basketball tonight and obviously is just an electrifying force. And I was curious. I know you're a big college sports guy, Matt. I know more college football than college basketball. But mm -hmm. where does she rank among your favorite college athletes to watch in your lifetime? And just who are those other favorites? Who are like your favorite college athletes? I mean, she's definitely up there. I think anybody who has like a superpower 
mm-hmm. as 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 a player. That's that's what makes people really fun to watch. Uh, and she does with the shooting. It's just totally ridiculous. Uh, I felt bad for Haley Van Lith, dude. Like people are like, oh, she's she's selling on defense. It's like, bro. What the hell is she supposed to do, man? For real. Left her on an island all game and she's yanging 30 foot pull ups over you. That's yeah, it's tough. like, yeah, it's like, I, I don't know, man. I can, a contest is a contest. Like, she had her hand up. I, I, I guess you got to block it, but she's way shorter than Caitlin Clark, too. It'd be like Isaiah Thomas on an island with, with Steph Curry or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know? It's mm-hmm. just, it's just brutal. So she's pretty high. I don't know if I have an exact list, but I was thinking about who my all-time favorite. Well, I think the all-time best college athlete as more of a college football guy is Cam Newton. Mm-hmm. I'm also a Panthers fan. I'm also a little bit biased. But um, going back and watching those clips is some of the most like a man amongst boys, one man army, you know, footage we have in football, man. It's a sport that's not supposed to work like that. And for that one year, it did. I mean, they had... The worst defense, Auburn, in 2010 of any title team in the last 30 years. And they had, like, no NFL players on offense outside of Mm -hmm. Cam. And they won the national title, which is so hard to do in college football. You need to be so good. It's not one of those sports that lends itself to underdogs at all. No, no, no. So... I think I think that's one of the most impressive accomplishments in all of of, of, of college football. But if if I'm I'm just talking about like my favorites to watch, it's honestly like kind of all dudes from my teams. I don't know if you guys are the same. That's where fair. it's like your list is sort of made up of of you know, I'm much more of a homer with college. Like I'm wearing the Gamecocks hat today. Thought a lot about Cox. Connor Shaw. Mm. Connor Shaw used to be one of my favorites. His comeback against Missouri. In 2013, at number five, undefeated Missouri night game. He's Incredible. like sick, and he has a knee injury, right? Flea so game. Dylan Thompson, the backup, starts. They go down 17 nothing. 12 minutes left in the game. Connor Shaw comes in with a knee brace. And they, they come back and win it in double overtime. And what did the Cox right. do that year? How good were they? They were, I mean, they were pretty good. That's back when they had Spurrier, but they didn't like go win the national title or anything. Yeah. No, I wasn't trying to rag on them. I was legitimately curious. No, no, no. They had some very good years back in the Spurrier days. Oh my God, they went eleven and two exactly for three straight seasons. How about that? Yeah, they were really good. They were really good. Um, I'm trying to think of who. I mean, you got your Ohio I, State guys. I'm sure. I mean, I got. I mean, I can name a thousand Ohio State guys though. I mean, Devin Arnell. Smith is a really good one. Bro, Devin Smith, his senior season, 900 yards, averaging 30 yards a catch <laughs> is just ridiculous. That man that scored touchdowns and he did nothing else. Cardell Jones is a great one. Um, Evan uh, Evan Spencer is a great one. He had that, I was watching the other day that 2015 Alabama Sugar Bowl game where he had one catch for seven yards, but he had a, a perfect throw for a touchdown. He had a perfect mm. onside kick recovery. He had a game you know, like ceiling block for that Zeke run. That was awesome. And the UC guys, of course, because I went to Cincinnati when they went on a run undefeated you know, all the way up Ritter. into the playoffs. Only group of Little five Caesar's teams to ever get it week. done, honestly. Little Ritter is up there. Jerome Ford, Sauce Gardner, such a beast. And yeah. uh, you, it, it, was, it was cool because like then you could like go out and like you just see those guys out um, yeah. around campus. So, And you would teach them TikTok Riz. And I'd teach them TikTok Riz. Um, <laughs> I, it might be Sauce Gardner, though, because he was just so dominant. And he was so good when we were there. Um, yeah. So it, Sauce might be my one, but there's a lot of dudes, man. Sauce is I don't a know great if choice. I have, do you guys have – now, don't tell me you guys have, like, perfect balanced rankings. Like, here's my top ten. Not at all. Not at okay. all. Okay. Well, who do you guys I mean, have, like, then? I mean, the most electric guy, like where I was glued to the TV, would probably be Burrow. Um, I, I'm not a big college guy, but to get me like locked in, Burrow was so gnarly. Like every game he played, I was like, dude, I, I gotta watch. Devonte Smith uh, was super fun. Um, and honestly, if we're going homers, my two homer guys would be from Virginia Tech. I would say Tyrod Taylor. Um, I watched like every game that Tyrod played at Tech, and I didn't Team understand. Rolling. Why he wasn't like a, you know, top, not, I'm not saying he should have been like a first round pick, but like a forced four rounds kind of guy. I was shocked he slid to the sixth. And then, dude, David Wilson, I don't know if you guys remember David Wilson uh, at Tech, dude. He was special. Like, I thought David Wilson was a 
was going to be a superstar. Uh, he got drafted by the Giants like as a backup to like Ahmad Bradshaw and Brandon Jacobs, and then he broke his neck. Dude, David Wilson, I thought was going to be raw. He's one of my favorite like homers, but all time to watch. And Caitlin Clark is up there, dude. Because like mm-hmm. you said, that superpower, the uh, she's like female Steph Curry, dude. Her her kind of skill, her uh, creation off the dribble, like. And I'm proud, too, because I think the big fundamental misstep and why people haven't been able to get in with a WNBA product is how the NCAA bills them as stars when they're coming up. Like, you think about, I love women's basketball. I think it gets really overly hated. I think the women play really good fundamentals. They know how to move the ball. Like, it it may not be the most aesthetically pleasing because they're not the most skilled, but the intelligence that these women show, how they play the game, it's really fundamental. Um, And... It's a lot of fun to watch, but I think about older uh, college basketball stars uh, in recent memory. Uh, Kelsey Plum, Brianna Stewart, uh, uh, Sabrina Ionescu, like Brittany Griner, Aja Wilson. When they're coming up through the ranks, it's like they're really highly touted in college. And then when they get to the WNBA, it's like, why have we stopped pushing them as publicity as stars? And that's what I hope is different with Caitlin Clark going. She's a legitimate superstar draw. People will, and that's what the WNBA needs, is somebody where they can say, hey, she's, uh, Carson, like you said in the intro to this segment, Caitlin Clark's playing basketball tonight. That's what the WNBA mm-hmm. has to do. Caitlin Clark is playing ball tonight. Y'all need to watch. And she, in my opinion, could be the first real stepping stone to the WNBA becoming something larger where this is our superstar. Come watch her play. You can't miss it. And I don't know if it's a marketing thing. I, I don't know what the issue, because I thought Brianna Stewart was going to be the, the stepping stone. I thought Kelsey Plum might be the stepping stone. I thought Sabrina might be. Caitlin feels different in the sense that she has the skill and talent level requisite to pitch her as, you got to come and watch her. Um, and she is. She is so much. The ability, the intensity. She's a shit, dude. She might be the best college, the best women's basketball player I've ever seen, dude. She is insane. And, um... I mean, I've quite little. I've never seen a player like her, bro. She's she's ridiculous. She's definitely up there all times in terms of. I gotta watch this game, man. I gotta tune in. I gotta see what she does. Yeah, on the WNBA point, I think there's a couple reasons that it's easier for people to get in to women's college basketball. Number one, I think familiarity with brands, and also some people have like personal attachments. Absolutely. Right? This you already like have a team. Yeah, that I was like very easy. School. It's like, okay. Yeah, and even if you don't have a team, like, there's just a familiarity. Like, obviously, every WNBA team has a city, but there's also an MLS team in a bunch of these cities, right? There's a million different sports leagues. There's just more familiarity with, oh, I associate with this men's college basketball brand or whatever. I like them. So I think that familiarity. I also think the fact that there is a cultural event that coincides with the cultural event in the men's sports, like that's just much more conducive to people saying, Oh, I'm interested in the men's tournament right now. While the women's tournament is going on, I will flip from one to the other. The WNBA and NBA playoffs don't overlap like that. And like they push it, they try, but I just think that cultural moment, uh, women's college basketball benefits from, I also think, Caitlin is a different level of phenom because you talk about the superstar traits, Matt. I thought that was such a great point because Brianna Stewart, I think a bunch of people who are dialed into women's college basketball will tell you better college basketball player than Caitlin Clark. Absolutely dominant defensive force, really good passing big, like super efficient volume score to just absolute force. I think she won national player of the year three straight years. I think she won the national title every year, but Caitlin Clark is this guard nearly averaging a 30-point triple-double, taking 13 threes a game, making shots from a range that is just unfathomable. Like, there's just a different level of spectacle there. And the aesthetic of it is so jaw-dropping that it does draw people in at a different level. It's kind of like Tim Duncan versus Steph, right? Who's going to draw a bigger crowd? It's going to be Steph Curry, obviously, 10 times out of 10. It's not as much about the caliber of a player, although obviously she's an incredible, incredible player. So I love watching Caitlin. I think it's been really fun. I'm excited to see her go against UConn. And the range, like the dynamism as a pull-up shooter is stupid. I've never seen anybody with that green of light and she just absolutely makes it rain. 
but also her passing is really incredible. Like mm-hmm. in transition as a pick and roll processor, she's yep. just something special, something special. When it comes to my other favorites, what do you guys know about the 2010 Cal Bears basketball team? Because that's a team that won the Pac-12 tournament. You guys are both looking down. This is important. I want eye contact when I'm talking about the 2010 Cal <laughs> right. Bears. Jerome Randall, Pac-12 player of the year, Pac-10 player of the year at that time. Utterly dynamic scoring guard, five foot nine, basically Isaiah Thomas, but he never got a crack at it. Would go on to be NBL MVP though. Handle by Randall. Just hung him up this past year. Yeah, thank you. That's the reaction I'm looking for. Patrick Christopher, older brother of Josh Christopher. Let's be honest, the better brother. Just never got a fair crack at it. Incredible athlete, dynamic three-point shooter. Theo Robertson. Now that was a big physical athlete who also could shoot the ball, by the way. My favorite. Always, I felt the most underrated, Jamal Boykin. Just a classic, hard-nosed big. And that was a team that really meant something to the city. Mm -hmm. Really, though, I mean, a lot of my favorite college athletes are Cal basketball players, which is stupid because Cal basketball has never been There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's just when I was young. That's how it is. You should love, like, I love all the players on my teams, man. Like, especially in Cincinnati, dude. Like, the Cincinnati Reds I'm really into right now. I love that. Dude, I love, I love those guys, man. They're hype. It's beautiful. Um, it's childlike. It's how sports fandom is in its purest form before you're analyzing everything. You're just like, hey, these guys are close, so we're going to go to six games a year, and that's pretty fun. Outside of that, Cam, like just the spectacle, is unbelievable. I'm trying to think about other college football runs that I really enjoyed. I really like the other Auburn team, the Nick Marshall and Trey Mason Oh, team. yeah, dude. I mean, just insane. That team was just touched by god they just had that team of destiny feel to them college basketball it's kind of boring because a lot of those guys went on to be like at least somewhat nba relevant i remember doug mcdermott it was pretty electric just like the scoring numbers that he was putting up year after year that fox malik monk backcourt at kentucky i thought they were so fun to watch I loved Draymond in college, actually. I don't know why. I kind of always liked Michigan State, and uh, good call by me on that one. So lots of good choices, local and otherwise. Caitlin is certainly some of the best among them. But let's just be honest. We all know what time it is, and we're chopping at the bit for it. We're an hour 40 minutes in here, and yet we're really only getting to the lead billing. Matthew, why do you hate Jermaine Cole? Why? I don't hate him, bro, but, like, he came after Kendrick Lamar and, like, well, no, 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 no. Kendrick Lamar, more. Kendrick Lamar came after him. Yeah, well, Kendrick was right though. So. Oh, motherfucker! I'm on the that big team, three. Man. It's big me. That's true though. Kendrick Lamar is a lot better than Drake and than J Cole though. Okay, why? Why do you love Kendrick? I don't know. Like he's just like. I've... Go listen. I'm, look, I'm not Fantano here, brother. All right. I'm, no, I'm just. I'm not gonna I'm be able to break. Curious, the, man. I think. Look, I, I. I think even like, Mr. Morales and the Big Steppers, like people are like, oh, that's that's trash. I thought it was still really good. Like, yeah, it's probably not you know Good Kid, Mad City or anything. It's a Butterfly, but like those two albums are better than anything Drake or or J Cole have put out. And I like some no, of the J Cole I stuff. Disagree. And and I like look Drake. I think Drake might be a. Whatever album came out when you were like 15, 16 will always be your favorite Drake album. I think that might be the situation, although I could be completely off base there. Um, mm. But I, I, I just I just think Kendrick's music holds up a lot better. Uh, and I, I go back to it way more. And I, I think like today, I, I listened to J. Cole's like, you know, his like diss on Kendrick. And I just didn't think it was that good. I didn't think it was that clever, man. And some of the lines... And in, in, in this new album, I mean, the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, M, N, O, P, that's me and not taking the L. Like, come on, bro. Like, yeah. there's absolutely no way. And the fact that, like, J. Cole, I'm not trying, like, if, if you if you like J. Cole, like, I do get it, I do. But, like, the fact that J. Cole both has sort of, like, the, the big three sort of aura, the pull like that, but, you know, he's, he's saying bars that would get a guy like Chance the Rapper or Eminem just crushed, just crushed for saying something like that, I think is totally unfair. Mm. I disagree with the characterization of J. Cole as being some sort of cornball. And I think that it comes mostly from people like Logan Camden, who I don't think have ever listened to a J. Cole album once in their life. I'll explain why I love J. Cole. 
okay? Because once again, I come to this discourse with an open mind and with the mindset of a peacemaker. I like all of these big three guys, okay? The thing with Kendrick is uh, I find a lot of people criticize J. Cole for viewing himself as like being this, oh, I'm so intellectual. Look at the depth of my lyricism. It's The and problem then, is that like people think he's like, I... He's kind of wrong, man. I like just that. don't agree that he's wrong. I think he has a lot of great bars. I also think what I love about J. Cole is that he does bring that dimension of like, oh, wow, this guy's a great lyricist, but it's also very grounded. And like, especially when I was younger, I was like, this dude is dropping really clever and insightful and well-crafted bars, but they're also relatable like i don't necessarily have to parse through a thousand different complex ideas like i can understand what he's saying and yet there is some complexity and like clear cleverness to it and i just thought he's a great storyteller i've always thought that like j cole simply put can like deliver a really nice narrative arc in a song or an album for your eyes only bro that's like a masterpiece 2014 forest hills drive i mean Obviously, For Your Eyes only has, like, this entire connected, interwoven story. 2014 Forest Hills Drive is just banger on banger on banger on banger on banger. Like, that is such an amazing album. Those are, like, two perfect albums. And then everybody's just like, fuck J. Cole. And I'm just left to wonder why. Like, I respect I've... Kendrick a lot. I've never loved listening to Kendrick. I also just don't like Kendrick's voice. So I think that's kind of part of it. Like, I, I like I, him. I think, I think I appreciate the cleverness of Kendrick, though. I, I think... Or like, like maybe it's like a little bit, you have to parse through it a little bit more. I, I, I like that. And I think I could say that Kendrick's a great storyteller, but what I really think kills Cole is that like, it just feels very stagnant, man. Like his stuff has not changed at all, man. And like with the off season and from what I heard of his newest album, it's just like, man, this is exactly what we were doing I, back in 2016. And it just feels, I don't agree. I don't it think, just doesn't don't feel think... that special or that different. I don't think the off season sounds really anything like 2014 Forest Hills Drive. Now, I think, I think Kendrick is like super experimental, but I also think we do this thing. And listen, man, I am pro people being outside the box. Okay. I like indie movies. I like indie music. I'm pro art. I'm fascinated by art, but I do think to some extent there is just like this subset of people who are like, Oh my God, this guy's so artistic. And we're just gonna, we're just gonna praise him endlessly because he's artistic and Kendrick can do something like we cry together. And it's like, I don't think people necessarily love that, but at the same time, they're like, he's a genius. He's a genius. And so we'll allow it. Could you imagine if Jay Cole released a song like that, bro? Like that would be it. That would be the end. And so he's just given a leniency that maybe more people should have, but other people don't have. Everybody always wants to say, like, Kendrick is this genius, and so he's good no matter what. It doesn't matter if he never drops music. It doesn't matter if his album is super underwhelming. Like, Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers, bro, for the weight, that's an underwhelming album. Because it's, he's The off-season is no better, dude. Yeah, if I, anything, I enjoy it's... the off-season more. <sighs> I enjoy the off-season I... more. But the thing is, people don't treat J. Cole like a god. People treat Kendrick like a god. Yeah, I think they absolutely do. I totally Yeah, I agree, that, too. I think, I think a lot of people take issue with J. Cole's... I think it's just the toxicity of the fan bases, if I'm I only being ever see J. Cole getting shat on. And no, I don't know. I mean, I see a lot of J. Cole defenders like you, too, bro. And I'm not saying either you guys are, are wrong or right. And let me be clear about this. I couldn't care less about two really rich guys who have already accomplished and climbed the mountain and gotten to the top. I could really, I couldn't care less about these guys beefing. They are well off. This means nothing. It's the perpetual argument of who's over who. I'm impartial to Kendrick because Good Kid Mad City is literally my second favorite album ever. That's why I'm impartial to Kendrick. It's partial. Uh, co college dropout is partial. Excuse me. College dropouts one. Good Kid, Mad City is two. I had both of those CDs. I listened to them every morning on my way to school. So I'm. It's like it's like you just said. That was one of my favorite albums when I was a kid. So I'm never gonna switch up. But it's also like. I don't know. Man, they're both goats. It's like the LeBron MJ thing, man. Why can't we just go? Look, bro, they're all up there. So who cares? Because no, that's not how rap over works, here, man. bro. No, but rap, Look, it's like, that's part of the that's part of the art form, man. You go at people, and it's fun. Right. I it's, do think that that's, that's... Go ahead. Sorry, J. Cole's a big cornball, though, right? We can agree. J. Cole's a cornball. Why? He is Why? a cornball. Why? 
He's, he's not corny. Drake, bro. He's not Drake. He doesn't he, go, I need a max win. Drake does like a million corny okay. things. And Drake's the biggest. Drake is say, number one. That on guy's the corny. That's but why. Drake is like, Drake, Drake is at least like kind of like buys ball. into it. He kind of like, it's kind of like his thing, dude. Like he, he'll do corny stuff like self-aware. J. Cole, it's like, you know, he's like a little more calculated, but it'll be like A, B, C, D. It's like, dude, dude come that's on. that's one bar. That's one bar. Now I will say, And it's, it's, Cole, it's ruined him. It's Jake over. Co Take Forest Hill Drive off Spotify now. God, dude. Is this some sort of South Carolina, North Carolina beef that I don't know about? <laughs> no, bro? dude. That's that's what kills me. I wish so badly I loved Cole. He's the Charlotte guy. He is, dude. It does kill me, man. Okay. And we've got I mean, it's that and baby and Yeah. All right. All right. We don't so Cole is self-serious, right? Like, he definitely thinks he's super yes. smart. But Kendrick is the exact same way. Kendrick but Kendrick, so my, my point is that Kendrick is right. And that J. Cole is right. not. I think they're both right. That's, I think that's... they're both great artists. And I think they are look, both I, really I, smart. I, I just, I, I think, I just think like Kendrick is kind of a better writer than J. Cole. And it feels more earned. I'm not saying that J. Cole is stupid necessarily. Like if I tried to write anything like that, it would be a disaster. Um, mm -hmm. Have you listened to Free Eyes Only all the way through? Yeah, it's been a minute though. It's a great album, dude, and it's a but really I, I just feel well like written and well crafted album. Yeah, I'm not saying he. I just I just think especially like with his latest stuff, like as time has gone on, I feel like I've gotten a little bit farther away where I'm like, yeah, this is fine, but this sounds kind of like some stuff I've already heard before a million times. It just doesn't feel like it's it's separating itself anymore like it used to. And the thing is, I don't even think Cole is bad. Like, I agree that those albums are good. I like a lot of J. Cole songs. It has kind of turned into, like, the LeBron MJ stuff where it's like, okay, well, if Cole fans are going to be mean to Kendrick on Twitter, then now J. Cole is terrible, actually. I've decided he's horrible. Have you guys? Yeah, but I don't know. Have you guys ever hopped in a whip with your fellas and they turned on J. Are Cole? Are you kidding, bro? Like, what America did you grow up in? 2014 Forest Hills Drive, you guys did not bump. You didn't bump no role models. You didn't bump apparently. You didn't bump 03 Adolescence. You didn't bump January 28th. You didn't bump Love Yours, Different Vibe, but Amazing Song. Nah, but I went to McDonald's and I got the plain hamburger with the cup of water, man. And you listen to Yeet, bro. And you listen yeah. to Nav. And I'm not and even... look at you being in a... I'm, my, no, no, I'm no. musically no, superior no, 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 no. to you. I'm not. I'm I listen not. to what I like. I listen I'm to country music. Saying, I listen I'm to not metal, dog. I listen to everything. Bro, so do I. I listen to all sorts of stuff. I listen to pop punk. I listen to a bunch of music that, you know, people think, oh, that's corny, whatever. I'm not, I'm not shitting that's on That's why I, I think music believe. debates are inherently dumb. Music is so subjective. It's like, who cares, bro? It's everybody's opinion. That's why... It's like, bro, why are we... Critical success in like mainstreams. That's why I think debating music is a shit show. That's my take, bro. It, like it's so movies? subjective. I like debating oh, yeah, sports. That's why we do this, bro. It's like sports. I feel like you can have a. It's results, man. Music is so much more subjective, bro. That's why it's so much harder having these debates. But that's sure. but that's kind of why that debating movies and music is so fun because you can't really be like wrong. Like you can't you can't fuck up that bad, so it's really yeah. just yelling at each other. And um, that's peak. <laughs> that's peak. Which also, is awesome. Dude, I just don't get that. I, I don't get the notion that like J. Cole doesn't have like bangers and like listenable music. Like that to me is his appeal over Kendrick largely. It's like these guys are both good lyricists, really good storytellers. I don't disagree that Kendrick is like a more genius writer. I don't disagree with that. But with Cole, I get a really good writer who I think sounds way better. I think sonically is just more pleasing. And like, that's the balance, bro. That's what I'm looking for. It's like Drake can give you all of these top hits, but these days they're a bit vapid and repetitive. Drake, and it's Drake just has like, been... Whatever. I used to love Drake the last I'm eight years. You. I'm, I, I'm exactly not, man no. and but this is this is my take i think like i really do think whatever came out when you were like 15 years old drake album was maybe very was your true. favorite like here's the thing dude i love views and i like kind of in my heart like know that views is not that good but i love views man that's one of my most listened to it's albums ever probably it's, it's pretty, pretty good, good man album. And it it's holds not up like, he never puts out trash but it's just like it's not nearly as good and there's more and more corny well, it's moments. less it's it's less authentic 
It's way less authentic. Like it's yeah. man, it's manufactured. Drake's a bot. I think it's why people have turned. It's all ghost writers. It's all hits makers. It's all whatever he puts he's out a as a banger king. because he's, he's got. About yeah, he's got a hundred people working on it. Kendrick and J Cole stuff is a lot more real. Like yeah, that's why I say when we're doing cornball rankings, that's why I think Drake has to be the number one cornball like in the industry, right? It's Drake. And no, not just, in the industry, bro. There's some cornball. If you're talking about at the top of the game, sure. I'm saying at the yeah, mainstream. But there's guys, a man Drake named Logic out there. I don't know if you're familiar. We got hey, NK. Hey, he's biracial, man. Cut him some slack, all right? He is. M you're right. MGK is is nuts. <laughs> MGK is crazy, That's... bro. There's some cornball. That guy, dude. Drake that guy is, is tatted. That guy is like tatted neck down, like fully black, like a 2K character, bro. Yeah, that's weird. He's a weird guy. He drinks blood. He's a weirdo, man. Yeah. Well, also a Cavs fan, Matt. So congrats, man. He's he's one of you guys. He's not a Cavs fan. He's a LeBron fan. Are you sure he's not a? Cavs? I'm pretty sure. No, he's I'm talking a Cavs about. Fan. I'm talking about Matt. I'm talking about Matt. He he, he looked. Matt's in not eyes a like, Cavs. What? You're not a Cavs fan. I'm not a Cavs fan. I'm a Hornets fan. Oh yeah, I don't know. I guess I just thought LeBron. Yeah, he's just a LeBron. I, look, guy. I, 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 I pulled for the Cavs like a second team because my dad and all my friends are Cavs fans. So I'm sort of like. I'm like, it's like the same with the Bengals because I live honorary. in Cincinnati where it's like, I, I do root for the Bengals, man. Like, I'm not going to be in the city and be like wearing my Panthers hat out on game day when we're going to watch yeah. them. It's like, I'm not a dick. So Yeah, great atmosphere in Cincinnati, I will say. I watched a, oh, yeah. a, a not-so-fun defeat there for the Bills, but I had a lot of respect for the fans. I love cities where, like, football is central like that and there's not as much going on so it just means everything carson do you have a favorite i want to hear your guys contra do you have a favorite kendrick album or a kendrick song yeah my favorite kendrick album is good kid mad city i think that's a great album i think that's what about a, you a, a Matt? you got album. a favorite j cole song or album j cole's album is probably forest hill drives probably it's a fantastic is. album but right. also bro also sideline story is so good born sinner hanger i'm telling you i don't like his recent stuff as much but i think that there is just this lingering animosity towards j cole that i'm not good with this album this album not very good it's his weakest album now i did like the start i thought it started strong and then it tailed off and the kendrick diss very underwhelming and it very really bad. Felt like he didn't Twitter want being to like, do This it, was bro. a warning shot from Cole. It's like, come on, man. He did say that. He did say it's that. And I held that hope. I was like, God, I hope there's a second. I hope there's a second track. I hope a second track is about to hit Kendrick Tower. But <laughs> I uh, <laughs> just felt like he didn't want to do it, bro. Like he had at least two bars where he was like, I love you, man. I don't want to do this, but you made me. And it's like, that's not good for a diss track. A diss track, you should be ethering the other person. Mm -hmm. You should be, fuck you, you short-ass, pretentious little bitch. Like, that yeah. should be the whole song. It shouldn't be like, you were the chosen one. It's not Obi-Wan and Anakin here, bro. He challenged you. He came at you. Come at his head. And that's the one thing that Kendrick really did well. I didn't think his diss on Like That was, like, that great. But he fucking came at it with some intensity, man. Like, he came at it with, like, I'm the best in the game. You guys suck. And that was cool. Because now Drake's probably not going to respond. And J. Cole's response was not good. So Kendrick wins that round. But respect J. Cole, everybody. That's all I have to say on the matter. Nah, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, that's a good counter. That is a really good response. No. Um, I don't have anything to say to that. Jackie, uh, Jackie Moon and Semi Pro, man. Everybody love everybody. ELE, bro. ELE. Shout out Jackie Moon. That's a good man right there. And that's Dude, a he also could make a hit. Love I was going to say, better artist than anybody we're talking about today, man. For real. One hit wonder, but it was a great, great song. All right, gentlemen. Any final thoughts before we get out of here? It's been two hours. That's a long time. It's and it time. seems that nobody else has any more thoughts, which makes sense because right. we've uh, drained you guys of everything you have. All right. Thank you for coming on, Matt. As always, an absolute blast to have you. Everybody go follow him everywhere. Spawn Hour, TikTok. Go listen to the Stay Hot podcast. It's fantastic. Got our friends Theo and Bladen over there too, obviously. Doing a bunch of awesome stuff throughout the year. If you want more of our content, subscribe to the YouTube page. 
I have done a couple video essays this week, a breakdown on Paolo Boncaro, a breakdown on Jokic versus Wemby. If you guys are interested in that sort of in-depth film breakdown, that is on our YouTube channel. You can find that. You can listen to the show across audio platforms. You can buy that hat that Logan's wearing there at thevolume.com. And uh, you can also join our Discord, which we always advertise that Matt is in. We say at the end of every episode, mm-hmm. join our Discord for a chance to talk to Matthew Sponauer, and here he is, guys, and he can confirm with a series of blinks that he is, in fact, in the Discord. I'm in and there. He, I'm in there. He's in and, there. He, he lurks. And I'm he's incredibly quiet. active. <laughs> <laughs> oh, never mind. He's incredibly active. I'm incredibly guys, active. Um, yeah. It's. I mean, there's a lot of people in there, but somehow, like, more messages are from me than not from me really <laughs> um it's it's almost like a bot spam type deal mm-hmm. and we have over twenty thousand members so think about that what an accomplishment that is that matt is still that prolific thanks for coming on man always great to have you and with that as always i've been carson brabber i've been logan camden i've been matthew Sponauer. you always gotta hit it man and this was nerd sash mm-hmm.